All right. Well, good afternoon and welcome back uh, for the uh, afternoon session here. It's uh, truly uh, a, a privilege and an honor to introduce uh, our afternoon lecture, uh, Thierry Poinceau. Um, so by way of introduction, uh, he's a researcher at CNRS in, in, in France and Surfax and also is a, is a visiting fellow at, uh, at Stanford. Um, among endless number of accolades that, you know, I could literally take all of Thierry's time by telling you about all the great things he's done. Um, but the most recent accolade, which I think is certainly noteworthy, is he was elected to the French Academy of Sciences, in addition to being a, a gold medal winner, uh, winner in the Combustion Institute um, as well. And so in terms of research, um, really Thierry's been um, one of the leading figures, probably the leading figure, that's more accurate to say, in, in I think bridging the gap between kind of more fundamental aspects of numerical uh, and turbulent combustion and bridging that to problems really of applied um, interest there, massively parallel uh, simulations and, and making CFD a practical tool at large scale for industry. And he has a ton of collaborations with, um, with industry. Um, so a couple of things just on a personal note I, I wanted to mention. Um, one is, you know, he does a tremendous amount of service to the community. He's one of the editors for Combustion and Flame, which means he does a lot of good things. And if your paper's rejected, maybe it's his fault. So, you know, <laughs> think about that as well. Um, but also, in, in addition to these schools, he also has a lot of uh, videos and things like that that are online. So I teach in the, in the spring an undergraduate course on engines, and I show three videos. One is a working Langan engine, one of the original internal combustion engines. One's a working auto engine. Those are both videos from uh, the Ditz Museum in Germany. And then I show his video that he has. He gets about a 10 minute video about thermoacoustic instabilities. And it's great because he's got a small combustor and a big combustor and they're fine. Then the medium one makes tons of noise and it surprises the students and it's great. So he's actually quite famous on the Princeton campus because the undergraduates always watch the video um, for the last decade um, um, in my course. And so um, his course uh, topic is, uh, I gotta get it right, theoretical numerical combustion. Um, and I think it's well posed at his, at his uh, plenary lecture at the symposium. He really stressed the importance of theory in combining that with, in this case, numerical combustion, but also experimental combustion. So I hope you'll join me in welcoming Terry Ponceau. Thank you. Well, f thanks a lot. That, that's too much. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a big pleasure to, to, to be back here. And I know all the time it's always a, a lot of fun to, to participate to these schools. Let me also uh, say that normally I try to be here every morning. I'm, I'm not teaching. So if you want to discuss things, you can find me somewhere in the room. Uh, and so you can, uh, we can discuss other things. So um, just before we, we start after the, this long introduction, uh, I wanted to to check a few things with you. Uh, is there anyone in the room who has never studied combustion before? Ah, there's one, two. OK, so, OK, interesting. Uh, but most of you have studied classical aerodynamics, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's a classic. Huh? Uh, and who, is, who has done CFD? Yeah, yeah makes sense. Uh, and who is a PhD student already? OK, that's uh, well. okay. you're the, the right target. That's fine. Uh, who went to Moshe's schools this morning? Not everyone. OK, because there are some overlaps between what he's doing and what I'm doing. So, um, so OK, this is what we're going to be trying to, to talk about. Uh, so uh, one of the things I'm teaching here that the others don't, uh, that's the plan, of course, of uh, the organizers, is to talk about turbulent combustion. So we'll spend a lot of time discussing turbulent combustion, what it is, how we model it, what we need to model it. But to do that, we need to look first at many laminar flames. And this is what Moshe is doing and what I'm doing have uh, a reasonably large overlap. So this is why I'm listening to Moshe in the morning to know what he has said already. And after that, we'll go into uh, the details. Uh, I know that many of you do CFD. We just saw that. So if you're doing CFD, what you want to know is, what model, which model should I use to do turbulent combustion, okay? Now you can be, you can save sleepy. I mean, I mean this, this has been the problem for 50 years. Which model should we use for turbulent combustion? So it's not going to be solved tomorrow. You have time to finish your PhD. Uh, that, that will take me uh, to uh, two topics here, which are numerical methods. You cannot do turbulent combustion modeling without worrying about the code in which you do turbulent combustion modeling. So we'll talk about, uh, Waves, I will talk about numerical methods, 
And I will talk also about chemistry. Um, I will go back to chemistry in, in a second. And then we'll go into examples, commercial instabilities, that's the famous movie that you, you heard about. Uh, and uh, we talk about flame oil interaction, about ignition. And I added a topic which is not in your notes, actually, but I think many of you probably are interested in that. That's hydrogen combustion, which is not as big in the States as it is in Europe, but at the moment, it's, it's a, a pretty big topic. So just a, a little word of uh, warning that I would have liked when I was at your place about the way the commercial community is structured. Uh, and that's a paper, actually, Iskander is a, is a French guy. He just wrote a paper a couple of years ago about that. You have to realize that this is a community which is split in two. And even during this course, you will recognize that. They are the, the people doing chemistry, and they are the people doing flow and turbulence. And people doing chemistry are people looking at the reactions, the individual reactions taking place in combustion. And uh, usually those people are chemists. And uh, Alison Tomlin, of course, here, is the best example of, uh, of this kind of people. And the other si on the other side, you get the people doing the flames. And when you do flames, you need chemistry, but you need also to look at the flow. And this is where the place where you start looking at turbulence. And these two communities, of course, believe that what they do is the most important thing for practical applications. And uh, the answer, of course, is that uh, uh, we don't know which one is important. And obviously, you have to combine chemistry and flow and turbulence, except that uh, in the real world, it doesn't work that way. You go to the symposium, you get sessions on chemistry and sessions on turbulent flames. And uh, no one goes from one room to the other, okay? Very few people. Oh, you, you have, this is a pointer, okay. Yeah. So uh, you will have to choose your side, okay, at some point. If you're sitting here, probably you're not on the chemical side, but uh, as I said, there is a big overlap now. You get more and more chemistry in the CFD. So uh, you, there is a, obviously there is a place here uh, which will be uh, required in the future. So many of the things I'm going to say, you can find it in, the, in this textbook that we wrote a few years ago. Now it's available on Amazon. You can just click and, uh, and buy it directly. And you can also get uh, an electronic access for five euros, I guess. Uh, if you go to this website here, I'm going to go back to that one. It's elearning.surfact.fr. You will see that there are many tools there that, uh, that you can use. So um, during the course, every time I will refer to something which is in the book, you will see a sign here saying, if you want more details, you can go there and uh, just you know, get the details you want at this point. So that's for the, that's for the book. In addition to the book, uh, there are many places where you can find recorded courses, but probably the easiest one to, to look at are also listed on the website here. And this is the same course I'm going to give here, but slowly on the blackboard, you know, old style. It is old, but it has a big advantage, is that you know, it's going very slowly. If I can write, normally you can write too, which is not the case with slides, as you know, which is a big problem, I believe. I believe that when you write, you learn, but he, I know it's uh, old style. But anyway, if you want to do it old style, you can download, you can just connect to this, uh, to this website. Uh, and the, the same website offers quite a few uh, tools here. And uh, for example, there are tools connected to Cortera, if you want to know the adiabatic flame temperature. There are tools which allow you to compute the unstable modes of a combustor, and quite a few people use that, actually. I find out uh, recently that this is used by quite a few people. This is a free uh, uh, website, and you can always connect there. So let me begin here by something that, that Moshe didn't do it. I think he's not really interested into that. But uh, if you're sitting in this room and you are contemplating the idea of working on combustion, uh, I think you have a few questions about you know, does it make sense? You know, 20 years ago when I started, well, more than 20, 40 years ago when I started, it was not a question, you know. Combustion was big, and I'm sure you, if you listen to, to, to TV, you may wonder about that. So I just want to start this course by a few minutes on energy policies and combustion, because as you will see, they are very closely uh, connected. The, the first equation, there will be a few equations during the course, I'm sorry, not today, it starts tomorrow, but the first equation here is easy to understand, okay? The energy today on Earth is equal to combustion. And that's something that people ignore. Most people believe that the energy comes, you know, from, I don't know, from the plug, actually. You just connect to the plug and you get, you get energy. Uh, and, but the statistics is amazing. It's between 85 and 90% of the energy on Earth, which is produced by burning something. It can be burning something just to, 
you know, to prepare uh, your food. And believe it or not, uh, more than one billion people on Earth today are cooking or heating their houses with uh, wood or something else that they burn. And among these billion people, more than one million will die every year because they don't know that CO and CO2 are not especially good to breathe, you know. So the, the importance of this kind of very uh, simple combustion uh, devices is enormous. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's very strong, it's very difficult to replace actually, but, uh, and of course at the end of the spectra, uh, of the spectrum you get people using combustion to go to space and, uh, and that's uh, of course very important. Uh, note that uh, even astrophysics is also about combustion. The equations that these guys are solving are the same that uh, the equations we solve for flames, except that they say that everything is, which is less than one parsec is small, and everything which is less than the one person of the speed of light is small. Okay, for us it's not exactly the same, but the equations are the same. It's flames. Now, uh, I'm not going to list everything which works with combustion, okay? I'm sure you, 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 you know about that. Just remember that uh, on average today it's about two liters per person and per day which is burnt, which is, is zero in many places and 20 liters in America. That's, uh, that's, about, that's how you make averages. <laughs> That's not my fault, huh? It's, it's <laughs> and uh, there are many things that people forget, you know, but you, you wouldn't have a cell phone, you wouldn't have a GPS without this kind of satellites, and these satellites don't arrive up there with electricity, okay? Not, not with solar, not with wind. They go there with combustion. Uh, so just to remind you of what combustion is, I'm sure you know, but I just want to, remember, to remind you of one number here. Combustion is the fact that you put fuel and oxidizer together and they burn and they produce products. And uh, the fuels, we talked during this course about gaseous fuels and liquid fuels, mainly obtained in piston engines, kerosene for aircraft and helicopters, and the others here gases for gas turbine for, to generate energy, for example. The oxidizer is usually going to be air with oxygen or pure oxygen, if you want very powerful flames. And the products will be CO2, H2O, which you cannot avoid, so I'm not sure you can call that a pollutant, uh, but CO, NOx, soot, you can avoid them, that's really pollutants. But the important equations to remember is that we wouldn't do all that if this thing would not produce an enormous amount of power, of heat, okay? We wouldn't burn anything without that. And the important thing is that the heat produced by combustion is just amazing. And uh, uh, for most hydrocarbons, you have to remember that, you know, uh, Q, the heat released by the combustion of one kilogram of fuel is of the order of 15 megajoules per kilogram, goes to 120, 25 for hydrogen. And uh, that really means that if you take one kilogram uh, of uh, kerosene, for example, it contains the same amount of power as 40 to 60 kilograms of batteries. This is why when people talked a few years ago about aircraft flying electric, I mean, the combustion people are just saying, sure, keep going, you know, just... Uh, <laughs> I think even in, in, in Europe, EasyJet said they were going to order aircraft. Said, Go ahead. These things would not take off, okay? Or they would need a wire. I mean, it's just, uh, it, if you multiply the, 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 the mass that you find in a 747, you know, like 200 tons, multiply it by 40. I mean, this thing will never fly, okay? It's obvious. So they gave up finally. They realized that finally someone wrote the numbers and said, no, it's not going to fly. So this is why we burn stuff, okay? Because there is so much energy in those things. Now, the second very important equation is that it's not going to change. And that's where uh, people have a problem, you know, <laughs> at the moment there's a problem with politics there. It's not going to change because the problem is uh, that uh, the global energy uh, needs for the world are keep going up very fast. This is a typical scenario when you see in gray what we burn in 2010 and what we will you know, burn, no, let's, let's say use in 2035. So the blue is what we will add. And we will add an enormous amount of renewables. We will multiply the power due to renewables by two, maybe even more than that. But the problem is that the global needs are increasing much faster. So every wind or solar system that we build is wide away swallowed by the global needs so that we will also burn more. And of course, we'll burn more and more nuclear systems. But the problem is that at the end of the day, uh, we will burn more. And that's a problem. Um, 
So this is where science comes into the picture. Your generation has to be there to burn more and better. Because if we keep burning the way we burn today, we are not in a good shape. So it's really a, a, a very important challenge for your generation is that you need to build better combustion systems because people will want them. Even, even if today they say they don't want them, they will have to. There's not much of a choice. So if you look at the global energy demand, you see the way it's increasing. And then you can see here, everything which is black is uh, carbon based and it's bad. I mean, we need to decrease that. Uh, the, and the whole question is, how do you do that? And uh, 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 we'll come back to that in a minute. But the way it's going at the moment, it's not decreasing. Okay, this is all the CO2 emissions. And you see that whatever the climate experts say or do, and at Surfax where I'm working, Half of the lab is working on combustion, the other half is working on climate change. So you can imagine the, the meetings are interesting. Uh, and what those guys, they were actually on TV. One of my colleagues was on TV a week ago and he said, combustion, just stop it tomorrow. Okay, so, well, how, how are you going to drive to your job? Uh, so it's a complicated problem, but the point is that for the moment we have we are not able to bring this thing down, okay? And that's a major issue. So uh, one of my students got this, uh, this picture, and I think it's a good idea of what's going on at the moment. We, we, it's a drug, and it's very difficult to do without it. So the question is, how do we do without it? Well, of course, um, that's what I want to discuss now, and it's important for you. Combustion is the problem here, but combustion is also part of the solution. Of course, we need to do better what we already do. That means we need to burn things in a better way with a higher efficiency so that we produce less CO2. Okay, that's one part of the solution. But there's a second part, which is actually surprising, is that combustion is a key factor if we want to store energy. You know that the problem with wind and the solar is that you cannot store these things. And if you cannot store them, uh, the way you manage the grid is just impossible. You cannot, you cannot survive in a system where energy comes at random moments. And you need it at other random moments. I mean, these things have to match at every instant. Remember, uh, consumption for electricity must be equal to production second by second, okay? And so uh, uh, if you don't know what's going to be produced, you have a problem. So the typical example here is that if you need this amount of energy at one point and you produce only this one, how do you get the difference? Well, the way it's done today and the way it will be done in the future is to use gas turbines. Gas turbines, you can ignite them when you want, you can stop them when you want. So gas turbines are a good way to uh, match what you need here. So you still need better gas turbines. But the point is that it can be also the other way. There are moments where you actually produce more than what you consume. And there were quite a few examples recently in Germany, for example, they had too much renewable and they had to sell it at a negative price. They had to pay people to get it because, again, you cannot leave it on the grid. You have to use it somewhere. And now the nice thing when this happens is that you, uh, you have to store this energy. How can you store it? When you go to this strategy, which is called power to gas. So, for example, if you have too much wind or too much uh, sun, you just uh, you, you make electricity and you do electrolysis of water. Everyone has water. And you get H2. H2 you can store. And if you need it the following day, following week, following year, then you burn it. And then you can recover the energy. So you see that combustion is not only the problem, it is also the solution. Because if you want renewables, you need to be able to store them. And there are not that many ways to store, actually, this type of energy. And uh, the problem is not to store energy. You could tell me, OK, I can use a battery. OK, but you're not going to do that. Because the amounts which are needed are amazing. If you need to store like only 10 or 20 percent of the global energy consumption of the Earth, I mean, you're going to have a lot of batteries, OK? So this is a log scale here giving you the storage capacity and here the time. Those of you who are maybe playing with cars, you know, you know that if you leave your cars for six months and you try to turn the key and the battery is dead, OK? So you cannot store energy in a battery for six months. You know, probably one month is kind of things you can do. You see the batteries here. And the largest battery built by Tesla is somewhere in this range here. But you see one, two, three, four, five, six order above, you have gases and H2, because gases, we know how to store gases. Just build a big tank and you keep the gas in the tank. You have to avoid leaks. We will go back to that. There can be other problems. But uh, technically, 
we know how to do these things. And the, the amount of energy that you can store for one year with this system like this is just enormous. So this could be a solution to the storage of renewables. There are many other problems, okay? But it's certainly part of the solution. So it's interesting to see that combustion here uh, is not only the problem, it's also the solution. Which also means that for us, combustion people, there are many places where we'll need uh, very sophisticated combustion devices. So to, 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 to conclude for the moment, uh, you see that we have to do all these things and here that combustion science is critical. I mean, the days where we could burn things in a very dirty way are over. I mean, th that's clear. Uh, but still, uh, for research, it is, it is a big challenge. Why do we have to stop doing it the way we did it before? Well, because combustion is the first source of pollution. Okay? It's the source of pollution because it produces things that you shouldn't have. CO. I'm not, as I said, I'm not a chemist, but uh, you and I should know that CO kills you uh, if you are beyond 0.4% uh, of CO in the air, so that's not much. This is how we kill people actually every year. If people have problems with the chimney, they get CO in their building or in their apartment and you, you die. I mean, it's very efficient. Uh, NOx, of course, you know, it's pretty bad. CHX, SOX, soot, whatever. Those are pollutants. Uh, and then after that, you get CO2, which changes climate. And then these two things are such a big problem that you have to do something about it. Uh, note that uh, when we talk about emissions of aircraft, for example, uh, uh, pollutants uh, as chemical species are not the only problem. You also have problem with uh, noise, for example. If you live in a place like this or in this one here, okay. so uh, w in your generation, of course, emissions are going to be probably the first control parameter of the whole problem, not only species, CO2, pollutants, and noise. Now, interesting thing about uh, combustion is that we talk about noise. You will see during this course that noise is what we call acoustic waves when they are small. When these acoustic waves become big, they can become uh, more than noise, okay? So uh, the, the best example is rocket propulsion like here. Now, the, 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 there's one number that you can keep in, in, in your mind uh, for a rocket like this. This is the power of a nuclear power plant in the volume of a small car engine. Okay? So you can imagine the power density, which is beyond that. So these things make a lot of noise, but not only noise. I mean, they make so much vibration that the whole system usually has problems. The first satellites that the French sent in space arrived there, but in thousand pieces, okay, because the vibration levels were so strong that the system died. Then, of course, we need to say a few things about climate change. This is a famous picture in Toulouse. In Toulouse, we get a school of uh, uh, pilots. They, they, they thought it was a good idea to, to do this picture. I think it's not a good idea if you're a pilot, uh, especially since the planes don't do that much. I mean, they, they, it's only two or three person compared to the cars. It's, it's nothing, but still. Uh, there's a very good paper, you know, that uh, I hope for you, you know, the Commercial Institute. The Commercial Institute is actually paying for you today. You know, it, this school is subsidized by the Commercial Institute. And Ed Lowe was probably uh, one of the most famous uh, guys setting up the Commercial Institute like 20 years ago when this was the important times. And there was a very good paper by Bob Sawyer here. Uh, and Sawyer was uh, uh, a professor, but he also worked as an advisor for... Uh, Schwarzenegger, when Schwarzenegger was the, the governor of uh, California. And uh, he was very interested in uh, environmental problems. He got fired, actually, by Schwarzenegger because he was asking too much. He was, as he said, he was the only one terminated, really, by the Terminator. So he was <laughs> swapped. And um, the, the, so this paper is a, is a, it's a plenary lecture of the Commission Institute. So uh, I encourage you to, to read it. It's pretty good. It's old, but it, it's, everything is in there. And what uh, Sawyer was saying is that uh, 
you don't need rocket science to predict global change. I mean, if you look at the, the old papers of uh, Fourier 2,000 years ago, just by a radiation balance in the atmosphere, Fourier said that, you know, if you increase CO2 by 2, you would increase the temperature by 5. It's a basic uh, graduate uh, exercise in one page. Of course, now today we get thousands of people working on the problem with very sophisticated model, but there is absolutely no doubt, I mean, ex except for certain people. We get a few in Europe, you get maybe more here, uh, but uh, uh, if you're serious about it, it's clear that we are the cause of the problem, okay? Uh, we make more and more CO2, and when we make more CO2, then the atmosphere temperature goes up. I mean, there's no discussion on that anymore. So we need to do something about that. Now, there are other aspects of combustion. You know, combustion is dangerous. Even if you're not interested in combustion, I guess at that point, if you're in that plane, you think it's an important topic. Uh, uh, the French have had pretty bad experiences, we know, with combustion. And of course, there are fires uh, we hear about them every day, you know, those things, we need to understand them. Even if you don't do any combustion, nature is doing combustion for you, so we need to do something. Uh, now, of course, the applications, I don't want to discuss too much during this course, too many people are looking at that. Uh, it's uh, weapons. Uh, it's quite efficient to kill each other with a knife, but with a, a gun, it's more efficient, okay? Uh, so combustion is everywhere. Combustion is in the missiles, in the planes in the propulsion systems, in the detonation, whatever. It's all combustion. So you, you will find a big amount of uh, research also, of course, in, in that field, but we'll try to avoid that. Uh, so I will talk a lot about gas turbines. Gas turbines are a good example of recent progress in the field of combustion because there are a lot of applications. Let me just mention two of them. The first one is to propel aircraft and helicopters. The second one is to produce uh, electricity. So those two applications are, are very important. And uh, the, 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 the design of the gas turbine is amazingly complicated. And uh, it's a very competitive field, a very important field uh, for, the, for those of us who work in, in, in combustion. The difficulty for you is that uh, uh, the old guys have been doing that long before you start. And so they were not that bad, OK? So they've been uh, in improving something which has been here for 80 years. It's not easy. And so you have to find compromises for these engines, uh, which are difficult to find, because now, of course, we need to increase, as I said, the efficiency more and more. The efficiency of a gas turbine engine is not that high, okay? 30, 32 percent, much less than a diesel engine, for example, for other reasons. And so uh, this has to go up. And uh, so one way to do that is to use simulation. And if you do CFD, I'm sure you are convinced of that. Uh, you will see during this course that CFD can do a lot of things, but probably not as much as what you believe. Um, we'll come back to that. So, if you work for, for General Electric or Rolls-Royce or, or Safran in France, uh, you, will, you, will, you would see that when people build an engine or design an engine, they don't use CFD, almost not. I mean, they use very simple zero D and one D models. And for certain things, they use uh, commercial codes which can be 3D and use what we call Reynolds average formulations. That means they compute only the mean values of the flow. And for certain cases, they go to what we call large dissimulation. I will describe that again in a few minutes. Uh, but this is really rare, okay? This type of methodology is not everywhere at the moment. If you build an engine, you, you do these things here. Now, the, the important thing to, to understand about industry is that in industry, they really don't care at all about anything about combustion. Okay? If it works, they are not interested. They only look at it when it does not work. Okay? And more importantly, they will want to build the best combustor, not to study the combustor A or B. They want to have 55, 65 versions of one combustor and find the best one. That means they want optimization. And uh, so in terms of CFD, you know, it, you realize it's not the same exercise as taking one engine and trying to find the velocity field at the outlet. Here, you don't know what the geometry is. What the people will tell you, they will tell you, give me the best geometry. And that's a much more complicated exercise. Uh, one way to, 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 to understand that is that if you look at an aircraft today, honestly, they almost all look the same, okay? fuselage and wings, and that's it, not much more. Why? Because it's close to the optimum shape. 
if you look at a combustion chamber, this is a combustion chamber from SNECMA for a fighter engine. Uh, none of them looks the same. And all the shapes are different. The way to inject the kerosene, the way to inject the dilution air, everything is different, which shows us that we don't really know how to do it okay, at the moment. And that's the big problem because, you know, computing this geometry is easy. But using CFD to tell me how many holes I should have, what should be the flow rate, what should be the angle, what should be the shape, I mean, that's a much more complicated problem. And that's what industry wants. They don't need to understand. They just want to have the best design, which is not at all the same problem. So uh, the other thing you will hear everywhere about combustion, you know, it, it looks good. You know, it's like artificial intelligence is one nice word. Another one is multi-physics, multi-scale. What does that mean? Well, it's an excuse to explain that we are not able to do everything. Um, so just to understand first what multi-scale means, you know, if you take an engine here for a rocket, these guys you know, may be one meter here and 1.5 meter high. And if you zoom uh, into this engine, uh, it's an engine which burns liquid oxygen, cryogenic, and liquid hydrogen. Uh, and uh, to inject them and mix them, you do that by injectors, which are here. If you zoom now on these injectors, uh, you have about 500 of them. That's the European uh, uh, rocket engine. And if you zoom now on each injector, that's what you find. You have liquid oxygen and hydrogen, and uh, you have combustion developing here. And if you zoom again on this zone here and you do a simulation, that's what you find. Okay? And uh, here you can see the flame, and actually the flame front sits here. We come back on that. It's a diffusion flame, and the thickness is about that much. Now, why is it multi-scale? Well, it's because now if you want to compute the whole engine, you realize you have a small problem, okay? Because you see that here, everything occurs on a domain here which is less than 0.1 millimeter. And uh, the initial size of the engine was one meter. That means that if you would resolve at least, you know, one point in the flame front, you would need 10 million points in each direction. So in 3D, it would be 10 million to the power three. So it's game over, okay? No one can do it. No one can do it today. No one will do it tomorrow. And you will be retired before anyone does it. Which means that we need models. We cannot solve by brute force the combustion problem that we have in many fields, okay? We can do it for a Bunsen flame of, you know, two millimeters uh, at laminar conditions, but not, not in a flow like this. And that will be the main problem for turbulent combustion models. So we'll talk about, you know, aircraft, we'll talk about rocket, we'll talk about cars, and uh, uh, because they actually combine many of these challenges that you will fight during your career, which is how to make combustion in a better way. And I will try to show you how CFD can help, but don't believe that CFD is going to replace uh, theory or experiments, because that would be a big mistake. Uh, just an example of the complexity now of the geometries themselves. This is a, uh, a four-valve, four-cylinder engine. You know, when I was your age, you know, we had to open this engine for the time because of the quake. Today, I guess anyone here, no one here has opened one of these engines, but this is how they look. Uh, and uh, they are amazingly complicated. Uh, and uh, if you do combustion, you will have to compute the not, not, not an easy game. Uh, these engines can be small, medium, or big. That's one specificity of combustion. It's its flexibility. It's a flexibility in terms of power, size, and also uh, uh, adaptability to different regimes. Here, for example, this is an engine of 0.1 cubic centimeter, 0.3 horsepower. Okay, that's for uh, small aircraft. Uh, but at the other side of the, of the scale, you have here an engine for a ship. And this one has uh, about 100,000 horsepower. And uh, of course, you can see one guy, he could fit in the, in the engine, in, in one cylinder. So you see, in, in between these two engines, you get any size you want. And here, I want to mention the first thing which, uh, which will keep us busy during this course, it's turbulent combustion. I will focus on uh, one engine example, which I like especially, which is motorcycles. Uh, uh, my motorcycle, for example, uh, is idling at 800 RPM, and it's also going up to 16,000 RPM. Same engine. Again, we talk about flexibility here. How is it possible that something which works normally at 800 can operate 20 times faster? Chemistry, is not going 20 times faster. 
we'll talk about flame speeds. Those who followed Moshe's course this morning, when we, when we will talk about flame speed, he will tell you that the flame speed of kerosene in air or of gasoline in air is about 40 centimeters per second. And it's not going to become 40 multiplied by 20. No way. So there must be something else which explains the adaptability of combustion. And this is the interaction between flame and turbulence. The interaction between flame and turbulence, that's exactly turbulent combustion, uh, explains this and allows it. When the engine is turning faster at 16,000 RPM, it's much more turbulent. If it's much more turbulent, that will increase the flame speed by a factor of 20, which allows the engine to work because otherwise the engine would not be able to function because there is 20 times less time to burn what's in the engine. And so we'll need to explain that. Uh, turbulent combustion is good because it allows it, but then explaining it and predicting it is much more uh, complicated. Now, on the other side, compared to, to piston engines, you get gas turbines, and it's the same thing. You can have gas turbines like this one here. This is a hand. This is a small gas turbine. And you can have this guy here, which is about 30 meters long. It can produce a power of 400 to 500 megawatts which is uh, typical of, uh, of a nuclear uh, system. Uh, so just a, a few pictures on, uh, on uh, aircraft engines. For those of you who are not familiar with those uh, technologies, so this is a travel through the engine. You go first to the compressor. The role of the compressor is to increase pressure. As you know, this is needed for high efficiencies. So in a Helicopter engine, you go to 20 bar. In an aircraft engine, maybe to 40 bar. Then you will go into the combustion chamber, which is this zone here. This is where we work. And then you will feed the turbine, which will be allowed to propel the aircraft and also to, to run the, 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 the compressor. Uh, this is the type of technology that we need to compute. This is the type of technology that you will need to optimize. And now, today, uh, it's fair to say that everything here is computed. It's not only computed, but everything is computed. Uh, that means every vein here has been computed and optimized, and the combustion chamber also has been optimized, and more and more uh, using large UD simulation. Uh, not, not every company, but many companies now are able to do that. Now, these engines can be uh, uh, very complicated. To pose the hélice, the men make basculer the core of the motor on the side. So just to give you an idea here of what we talk about, when we put this uh, combustion chamber into a real engine, ce réacteur de 2 tonnes, d'une valeur inestimable, se balance à quelques mètres du sol. Le moteur est en place. Of the aircraft. So when we have replaced them two times, most of the money went actually to uh, the engine manufacturer. Uh, so in France, for example, Safran uh, uh, typically gets more money out of an aircraft than uh, Airbus. Now these engines, of course, can be quite big. Après deux semaines d'assemblage, le réacteur est relié à de larges conduits aérodynamiques et transporté dans le pôle d'essai. And just by looking actually at the size of these monsters. And remember that this is flying, okay? You can imagine the power uh, which is associated to a monster like that. So just uh, to confirm the terminology here, we get the compressor, uh, low pressure, high pressure, then we go into the combustion chamber. This is what we compute, what we design, and then you go into the turbine. Um, if you look now, if you zoom on the typical problem of combustion, combustion is like cooking, okay? If you want to cook, Uh, and you want to make a cake, you're not going to throw the eggs and the flour uh, and the sugar in, in the oven and hope it's going to work. The first thing you will have to do is mix. Okay. Mixing is the key to everything. If you want to burn air with kerosene, you need to mix the fuel, which is liquid kerosene, with the air. And uh, this is a key problem in combustion. If you cannot mix correctly fuel and air, combustion will be not good. So this is the objective of all these systems here is to optimize the mixing, make the, the, fl the flame as short as possible. So we have here uh, a system which I will describe later. These systems are swirled. You have a combustion zone here. And I will come back later to that. There is, of course, another problem with all these chambers. 
is that the, this morning Moshe introduced what they call the adiabatic flame temperature. I forgot to tell you that the adiabatic flame temperatures of flames are of the order of 1,500 to 2,500 K for air, and they can go up to 3,800 if you burn with oxygen in a rocket engine. The temperature at which metals melt is 1,300 K. In other words, any flame on the metal wall will lead to the death of the metal wall, which is a small problem. Okay. Uh, so you will need to do something about that, and we'll talk about it uh, at Wednesday probably. We need to cool all these combustion chambers, and we need to worry about flame wall interaction because if you make a hole in this chamber, that's the end of the day. Okay? So you need to worry about uh, more than chemistry. You need to worry about heat transfer, fluid mechanics, and chemistry, everything coupled. So just an example of these chambers, the way you do mixing, a good way to do that is to have a lot of mixers. That's what we call sectors or burners. You have here, you can see, you have uh, eight or 10 here. At each of these locations, you introduce fuel and you mix it with the air so that your mixing, will, your, your, your cake will be as good as possible. And uh, one sector will have this kind of shape. This is a shape for a Chubomeka uh, helicopter chamber. And you can see how complicated it is. Uh, the air comes from this side, flow this way, then this way, where you inject the kerosene, then they mix here, they burn, then they make a U-turn here, and they go to the turbine. Every shape here, every size has been, again, computed, optimized, and tested. For an engine like this, before they produce the final shape, they have 60, 80 different tests, okay? The final shape is number 81 or something, because all the others didn't work the way they should. So it's a long, long, long process. And uh, making this progress very short has become a key problem. When we're doing hydrogen engines today, the objective is to fly them in two years. And two years is pretty short to be sure that you, you, your engine is going to be safe. So in these systems, you will see here at the place where we try to mix air and kerosene as well as possible that we use what we call swirlers. Swirlers are not common for people doing pure aerodynamics. You don't swirl in an aircraft around the aircraft. But in the engine, everything is swirled. Why? Well, I will give you an example in a few minutes. Just remember that uh, the air which is entering the system here is actually turning at the same time. It is swirling, and swirl is extremely important for, for combustion. Now, this is another chamber, uh, this one coming from a civil aircraft. And here you recognize there are much more injectors and much more holes here to dilute. Uh, I'll come back to this dilution effect in a second, but basically the idea, again, is that you need to cool the gases before they touch the walls. If these hot gases produced by a flame touch a wall, uh, uh, you're going to kill the wall. So this is a view of one injector. So you see this is my hand, actually, so it's not that big. Uh, one, one guy like this, about $10,000, okay? Because the, the, the design, the precision of the design has to be extremely strong because these swirling flows are very sensitive to perturbations. And this is what, what it looks when it's ignited. So here, the white zone that you see here is the zone where combustion takes place. It's the zone where the omega of Moshe this morning is non-zero. That's the place when you convert the fuel and the air into the CO2 and the H2O. You see, this flame is really short. It's not a long flame. You don't want a long flame. A flame which would burn outside the engine has no interest. You want to make the flame short, compact, you can do that thanks to swirl, and I will show that in a moment. So now, to, to, if you talk to an engineer working on engines, he will tell you, okay, this is an example of a, this is a fighter aircraft. Uh, this is temperature. You see here a, a very uh, funny zone here where the flame seems, seems to be sitting in the middle of nowhere. That's the place where the flow is swirling, and that allows the flame to stabilize here. I will come back to that later today. Uh, and then you dilute these hot gases by cold gases so that the temperature here, when you hit the blades here of the high pressure stator, which then leads to the turbine, is not too high. Typically 1,400, 1,500. It's actually, it's a classified information for a military aircraft. And of course, these blades are cooled. Otherwise, they would, they would die. So where you put the holes, how you cool the, these things are the key to making this chamber uh, survive. And when you talk to these engineers, they will tell you the first thing is that the, the turbine here should not burn. That seems a natural request. The second thing is that you must burn in this chamber everything. All the fuel that you inject, you have to burn it. 
no losses. And the last thing is that you must have a low NOx and a low CO emission at the, at the outlet, and today also a low level uh, of soot. And again, optimizing the shape of this thing to satisfy these objectives is the key problem today. And for your generation, the key problem will be to do that at 40 bars, at 50 bars, at 60 bars, because we know that when you increase the pressure, things are more efficient. The problem is also is that the temperature will go up, and then the blades here will not like it. And so this is a very complicated uh, uh, optimization problem, as I mentioned before. Um, I want to mention a few funny things then, again, about these engines. As I said, the key problem about combustion is adaptability. You must be able to do a lot of things with the same engine in a reliable way. So let me just mention a few things. Uh, the fact, for example, that the engine must work over a wide range of conditions. For example, when it's raining, it shouldn't stop. It looks like a stupid idea, but if you're in the aircraft, I'm sure you understand. Uh, it must be simple to reignite. You know that one of the constraints of an aircraft is that you can lose the flame at high altitude and be able to relight, which has not always been the case. Okay? If you look at the past of the industry, you will find examples where the, the pilots lost the engines and were never able to reignite. And the consequences are obvious. Uh, and then I will talk also a little bit about quenching. That's a fun example. Uh, so what is quenching? Quenching, you will hear this word many times. It's, it comes actually even Moshe, who is doing fundamental things, talked about quenching. And the pilot will also talk about quenching. It's the same thing. It's the moment where the flame goes away. Why would it go away? Well, uh, there are many reasons why you do that. Um, one reason, for example, for an helicopter is when you decrease the power suddenly. When you decrease the power suddenly, you put less and less kerosene, but the air keeps coming because it's compressed, and the compressor speed is not going to go down very fast. So you may be very lean at some point. That means you don't have a lot of fuel, and the flame might just be blown off. You can lose it. That's bad. Uh, and, but you can also have a, a, a problem that was uh, the case a few years ago. If you have a volcano blowing out you know, burned gases, if you, if you flow through that, there is no oxygen, or very, let's say, much less. If you decrease the amount of oxygen, then the flame also will die, and then you have the problem of, uh, of uh, reignition. So just an example of the test they do. This is an example where you take an engine and you inject water into it, and you check if the water is oh, touching the inundation. L'eau est déversée à un rythme de 140 000 litres par heure. La poussée du moteur doit être la même qu'en condition normale. On doit s'assurer que le moteur résiste à la pluie et à la grêle et que les compresseurs supportent une grande quantité d'eau en vol, qu'ils continuent de fonctionner et que le système de combustion est stable. Uh, and uh, it's another problem also for helicopters. You know that for an helicopter, you should be able to stop at a high altitude, stop the engine, and then reignite it later. And when you go, to, when it's 1,000 meters, it's okay. But if you want to sell an helicopter to India, and they tell you they want to stop the engine for two hours at 5,000 meters, temperature will be minus 40, batteries will be almost dead, uh, everything will be frozen, the oil of the engine will be frozen, and then the guy pushes the button and it has to restart. Not simple. Um, just, uh, uh, it, it, it's difficult to guarantee it's going to work. Uh, here again, I want to mention something from the fundamental point of view, is that in real systems, everything happens in a turbulent flow. We'll come back to that. But you know that uh, laminar flows are found only when the velocities are very small. When the velocities are large, everything is turbulent. And turbulence, from the point of view of what we do, that means from the point of view of simulations or understanding what's going on, uh, Turbulence makes everything complicated. And one example is that in an aircraft engine, you have a spark, you push on the spark, you hear the spark, bling, and it does not ignite. You push on the spark a second time, bling, it does not ignite. You do that four times, and the fifth time, bling, it starts. Which means that ignition is not repetitive, and then your life becomes complicated, okay? Because if it's not repetitive, it means you have to take into account the randomness of turbulence to predict if the ignition will actually work or not. And that, that's, that's, that's a pain. So when you want to optimize systems, that really means that optimizing a combustion chamber is a very complicated exercise. Okay. 
and uh, engineers, they usually they get crazy, you know, because they got 10 objectives, they fulfill very well nine of them, and the tenth forces them to revisit everything. So now they fix the tenth objective, and there are two others which don't work. The best example is they have this wonderful chamber, but it does not ignite at all altitudes. Okay, it ignites on the ground, does not ignite in altitude. So they change the design so that you can ignite at high altitude, but then it makes too much NOx. So they correct the NOx, but then it makes too much CO. And then they correct the NOx, the CO in the ignition, but then the chamber's wall are burning. And then they, you know, and when you talk to them, you see that uh, it's complicated. Of course, here, you would like to be able to do everything by CFD, and many CEOs tell you, compute them before you build them. That's the motto, you know, that's the, the quest. You should be able to use CFD to, to understand everything so that you can build the right chamber right away. On the paper, it's doable. In practice, it never works. What we can do is to diminish the number of tests, experimental tests, but in practice, we still have to rely on that. Now, I want to talk about something else. One thing which happens quite often when you do that is that you hit what we call commercial instabilities. Commercial instabilities is the reason I'm here, actually. This is why I'm, I, my, I did my PhD on commercial instabilities. Commercial instability is what happens when it should not happen. That means the flame that you are building, and many of you, if you do experiments, or even if you do simulations, you will see that instead of having a flame doing what you want, it starts doing crazy things. It starts to make noise, it starts to oscillate, it can quench, it can flash back, and uh, life becomes difficult. So the, 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 the classic arm. example See, is actually the PhD of uh, Ahmed Ghanem, uh, but many others the have, have, have done right it, but he left. has a very nice picture on that. Pre That's the flame behind the backward-facing step. So you inject a mixture here of gas and air, and you have a turbulent and flame. So you see here it's cold, 300 K, here it's hot, 2000 K, and you see evident. here a turbulent flame, what we call As a turbulent flame. Ratio it's a flame increased. at high speed, the so the combustion takes place in this zone. Now this flame is a good example of what we call stable flame because it's stabilized where we hope it should be stabilized. It's stabilized at the lip here, at the backward facing step. Now if we change, we try to optimize this flame for some reason because we have a problem with NOx or we have a problem with something and we try to make it, for example, leaner or richer. You can easily end oh, up with this type of behavior. This is a two thousand frames per second, step. okay? In the real world, it goes much faster. One might say that and the you see that the flame now, instead of staying here, is, to undergo is actually flashing back. That means the flame in case, goes in this direction, then this the direction, then in this direction. If you're sitting, my, my experiment was actually very close to that. If you cannot, you cannot stay in the room when this happens, ratio. okay? It's uh, your, your guts start the to oscillate too. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's actually quite, quite dangerous. Per and of course, the problem is that and this system is not built is for the flame to, to come here. The so if there is anything here which can burn, you are in trouble. The reason why the flame is doing that is that the velocity is changing sign. The flame cannot propagate here until the flow which changes sign. So in an engine, it's easy to recognize that if the flow is leaving the chamber by the inlet, it's not going to be the a good solution. Thing. Okay, it's a, So this kind of behavior is a major problem. And for years, we did not, well, even today, actually, uh, we, we have difficulties to predict that. We know how it happens, actually. Uh, it's a problem of coupling between one thing that we have not discussed yet and combustion, that's acoustics. Combustion, uh, we will have a course on that on Thursday. Combustion produces acoustics, and acoustics modify combustion. If the two get locked in the wrong way, you get into difficulties, and you get into combustion instabilities. So it's a coupling which we will describe where uh, you have an unsteady flow rate producing a large vortex, which produce an unsteady heat release, which produce an acoustic wave, which produce another unsteady flow rate, and the system gets crazy. This thing has been known for maybe 90 years now because it was a big problem in many systems. I've listed here a few of them, uh, Ariane in France, but the most famous one is Saturn for the pro Apollo project. Uh, but uh, every fighter has this type of problem. Uh, some uh, gas turbines for energy production have the same problem. Actually, any flame can have problems like this. It's quite, it's quite a, a common feature. When you try to optimize flames, that's at some point they start doing strange things on you. So, just to, to show you what happens if you have a commercial instability, you know, this is a, 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 an example of an injector after commercial instability. As you can see, this was not the design, okay? This is what happened afterwards. Uh, same thing here. 
that was not the design of the engineers, okay? But you, you recognize that when the flame came here, after that, uh, the engine stopped. Um, the other problem is these instabilities is that even if things don't break right away, these things generate an, am an amazing level of vibrations. And you don't want vibration in an engine. Why do you want to avoid vibrations? You want to avoid vibrations because uh, you have veins everywhere, and if something starts vibrating, you get into problems. What did I do wrong? I don't remember. Uh, that's. Uh, no, I don't see another one. No, here, the, the only one which works is this one. That's the one you've been yeah. using. Yeah, the one I've been using, yeah. yeah. So you will see here, this is a test which companies do on purpose. This is the most expensive test you can do. It's about 30 million dollars in one second. So what do they do? They, they take an engine and they break a vein on purpose, exactly as if this vein would vibrate and touch the casing and then it would explode. When this happens, the engine must survive. And no blade must leave through the engine, because you have passengers on both sides. So, le, the, 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 like on this, the you take the engine. Une détonation libère la palle du and disque à vitesse très purpose, élevée one day, et l'envoie dans l'enveloppe de l'hélice. And you check what's happening. Exactly like the commercial stability. When this event happens, cet événement libère une hélice. Yeah, one second. The engine is Le moteur est détruit. Ils ne seront pas réutilisés. And, but the point is, no blade left through the side, okay, because they are passengers. Now, this is the test, but like all regulations, it doesn't always work, okay? Uh, there was an example, uh, uh, when that, 2018, uh, when one of these things broke and went actually through the, through the aircraft. Uh, the most famous example is, uh, I think 20 years ago, a guy on the track, uh, he had a problem in an engine, a blade left, went through the aircraft, and impacted on the second engine, so he lost both engines in two seconds. And, uh, okay, this is, uh, this, you don't want things to vibrate, okay? If you have vibration in a plane, it's, no, no. so instabilities, you want to avoid them. Now, the most famous instability, and that's also probably the place where, in those days, people doing combustion had no problem of funding, that's 1962. Kennedy saying, we want to go to the moon, so they said, we need an engine to, to, to go there. So they took one existing engine, which is one of these guys, and they made it much larger, and they put five of them. And they say, okay, from the, you multiply the power, and that should be enough. And then they ignited it, and boom, exploded. So, oh, that's strange. So they reignited, and boom, exploded. Then they, they ignited for two years, actually. They did 1,300 tests in two years. I don't know if you can imagine. They had to build a plant, because they did the real scale test. Okay? They didn't play with an, a lab scale. They went right away for the full engine because they had to go to the moon, so they had no time. So this thing, they tested it more than 1,000 times before they found a way to make it stable because it was always exploding because of a commercial instability. And uh, the, the, the way to do that was to do tests. Of course, they tried to understand, but they, they modified the injectors and they add baffles here. These walls that you see are there to prevent acoustic waves to bounce in all directions. And we'll talk about that later this week. And so the only way to do that uh, was to spend about $2 billion in two years. And uh, as I said, to build a special plant to produce H2O2 and to produce one engine every half day. I think you can imagine the weight at which you do this engine. But again, like those guys would say, I mean, remember that when we did that, uh, it was a war, okay, between the Americans and the Russians. It, no one would do that today. You had to be fighting the Russians. Well, actually today, we're almost fighting the Russians. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also, of course, today we will try, we wouldn't do it only by test. We would use CFD to try to minimize the number of tests. This is the final engine. You can see the shape here. Everything here has been, you know, mod modified 1,000 times until they found something which did not oscillate too much. It's still a very noisy engine. The oscillations of pressure are of the order of 60 bars. Okay, pressure goes up and down 60 bars. Means no, no one else does that. But this, this was, of course, a very powerful engine. Now, this type of oscillations, combustion stabilities, can also be used. There are systems where uh, you can use them because they have some interest. For example, for heat transfer, since the flow is pulsating, it's cleaning the boundary layers on the walls and it's, it's increasing the heat transfer. And uh, the most famous unstable engine is the V1. That's not a useful one, uh, but uh, the, 
like everything in combustion. Okay, the Germans did it before everyone else. I just want you to show, uh, show you a movie of this guy here. It's a hybrid movie. There are some recent pictures, but there are also the black and white pictures corresponds to real engines. This engine was famous because since it was oscillating, it was making a lot of noise, and you will hear the noise actually from the, from the uh, initial movie here. So remember, everything in color is fiction. Everything black and white is a true picture. This thing needed a ramp to start. And after that, it would go from Germany to, to England. So those are with the Toute la nuit, le régiment tire des missiles sur les civils britanniques qui ne se doutaient de rien. Les hommes des sœurs ont assuré cette nuit-là. Le grondement des avions à pulso réacteur de Goslao annonce l'arrivée d'un missile V1. À l'approche de Londres, il entame sa descente en piqué. Cela coupe l'arrivée du carburant vers le moteur et le missile peut alors tomber dans un silence impressionnant. Et le problème est quand le moteur start, se coupait, qu'on sentait le danger arriver. Really à ce moment-là, l'engin était en chute libre. Je ne sais pas combien ils ont tiré en Angleterre, mais c'était quite a lot. Okay, uh, I think we're going to stop here for a break because I wanted to start on CFD now. So any, any question at that point? Nope. Yes? So let's suppose we have the complete admin system for the clear regime. And then we are using the band bus filters and getting the power spectral curve. We are getting the optimal critical frequency. So getting those optical critical frequency, can we just optimize the temperature part for the combustion engine? Yeah, yeah, uh, you're working in the, in the gas turbine uh, industry. Uh, sure, that's, that's the whole game. That's what we will describe uh, uh, later to this week. But this is a complicated thing to do, okay? The, the reason why a system gets unstable is that two phenomena match in terms of time delay. So if you change the, the distribution of temperature, you will change the sound speed. So you will change the, the eigen mode of the chamber. You will shift it somewhere. And if you're lucky, you might shift it so that it doesn't match with the flame. But then another one might match with the flame. And when you do, all the people have, I mean, uh, I was doing, I've been doing that for a long time, we know that uh, there's this capacity of limiting one mode and then you get another one appearing. You need to understand. You need, you need a tool to predict what's going to happen when you change the temperature. Well, zero emission depends what you're calling emission. If you're talking about noise, that's a different problem from emission. Quite often, when you're good for noise, and instabilities, you're bad for NOx. So there's a compromise between NOx and instabilities in many engines. I will also show an example of that. We go for coffee, and uh, we start again at uh, 3.15. Okay, so let, let's start discussing now uh, the place of CFD in this business. Uh, it is clear that uh, we are really anxious to find a method to eliminate all these problems uh, so that when we design an, a combustor, we can compute it first and then it will work right away. And this works quite well for aircraft. Okay? Today, if you go to Boeing or to Airbus, they have diminished the number of tests by maybe 10. But for combustion, it's not that easy because combustion is, uh, okay, if you want to talk about mathematics, it's nonlinear. Uh, I think Moshe explained that this morning pretty well. The shape of all the reaction terms that we have in combustion has this funny exponential dependence, which really means that, you know, in the physical world, it really means that combustion is a little bit like uh, uh, nothing or everything. Let me take an example. If you fill this room with gas and air, nothing will happen. Okay. Then if you heat it up to 100 C, nothing will happen. If you heat it up to 300 C, maybe, well, you will be uncomfortable, but uh, let's say that the gas probably doesn't care. But at some point, maybe around 700 or 800, everything will explode right away, okay? Uh, so, which really means that it's not a linear process, it's zero or everything burns. And then that is the source of a lot of problems because any 
error that you make on the threshold at which combustion starts change the, changes the results. And so this is why when we do combustion today, the state of the art is that, well, okay, it works. It's not great, okay? And uh, if someone is selling you a code saying it's great, it's just not telling the truth. It's not yet great. So you will we still need experiments, okay? And don't believe that your code is doing everything. So um, what are the methods uh, if you talk about turbulent combustion? As I said, turbulent combustion really means that we have unsteady flow, and then, so if you have an unsteady flow, we'll have also an unsteady signal of temperature. If we measure temperature in a combustor, this is the type of things you would measure if you would have a perfect sensor in your experiment. And if you would have a perfect simulation, which we call a direct numerical simulation, this is what you would match, okay? You would be able to capture all the details of this signal. I just want to mention here that when you see here a small variation of temperature over a short time, it corresponds to a small vortex. And when you see a long wave like this one, it corresponds to a big vortex. Now, people have known that for 50 years. And when we started writing codes, not me actually, I'm not that old, they started writing codes before my time, they said, we don't care about the details. We don't care about the perturbations. Let's look only for the mean values. That's what we call Reynolds average. Now we took simulation, once codes. And once codes, if you buy a code today, uh, a commercial code, they're going to give you the average temperature. Okay, and I will show you in a second that this is not enough. For many problems, knowing the average is not enough, you want more, and this is where people started doing larger dissimulation, which is what everyone is doing those days. And in larger dissimulation, you care only about the large eddy. That means you care only about the big eddies, which corresponds basically to the big variations here and not to the details. The details, the small vortices will be modeled, but the big vortices will be captured in your simulation. Now, by the way, you can remember something. If you pay one for once in CPU, you will pay 500 for a good LES, okay? So it's not cheap, okay? Don't believe that you can do LES at the price of once. It's not the same thing, okay? In one case, you get a Renault 4. In the other case, you get a Ferrari. It's, it, doesn't, it, it will not be the same machine. It depends what you want, okay? But uh, if you want to go just shopping, take your Renault 4. But if you want to go on a Formula One circuit, you make the Ferrari. So let me show you first, uh, everyone understand what turbulence is. It's kind of funny because if I take a, you know, a sophisticated word in physics, you're going to tell me you don't know, but everyone seems to know what turbulence means. So let me show you an example of turbulence by a colleague here, uh, Charles Benvaux at Johns Hopkins, uh, who did actually a DNS without flame of the simplest turbulence you can imagine, which is homogeneous isotropic turbulence. So homogeneous means it's the same turbulence everywhere in this box. Isotropic means there is no preferred difference, uh, uh, direction. So you can move this box in any direction, so it's the same. So you can do that very well with direct numerical simulation code. And you will see here uh, how a flow like this looks. Uh, and uh, we'll show you some uh, iso surfaces of vorticity, or of what we call the Q criterion, which is almost the same. So those are the places where there is rotation, vorticity. Vorticity is really what's important in turbulence, okay? It's the place where the flow is turning. And if there is a flame wrapped up in there, uh, of course, it will change the flame front. So here there is no flame, and look at the, what, uh, what vorticity is doing. And you see right away that for a turbulent flow like this, it's amazingly complicated, okay? Every part here that you see is a vortex, and these vortices, the small ones, are embedded into larger vortices, which are themselves embedded into larger vortices, and that's called the Kolmogorov cascade. Kolmogorov, 1941, it's probably the paper which is the most cited in the whole turbulent literature. He hypothesized that turbulence was actually proceeding like this. You get big eddies. Inside these eddies, you get smaller eddies. Inside these eddies, you get other eddies until you go to what we call the Kolmogorov eddy, which is the smallest one that you can have, which is dissipated by viscosity. And you see right away that for a flow like this, which is non-reacting, extremely simple, it's actually extremely complicated. So whoever is saying that he's going to compute all that is not telling the truth. It is a very complicated problem. Actually, turbulence is probably the most difficult problem to solve in science. Even for physics, for example, people know that, you know, quantum 
physics probably easier than turbulence in practice. So we need to compute that, and in addition to that, we need to add mixing and combustion. So we are not going to be able to do it rigorously. We need to do, you know, something. So what do we do? Well, usually we average, okay? First thing, we average. So in a gas turbine, if you do a computation of a gas turbine and uh, the simulation code, you know, fluent or whatever, tells you temperature is 1200 K. No, it's mean temperature is 1200 K. Instantaneous temperature, you have no idea. In an engine, in a piston engine, you cannot average over time because you have the movement of the piston, so you average over cycles. So if I look at the results of a piston engine simulation, I can tell you that at this crank angle, temperature was 1200 K, which means that if I take 1000 cycles, all of them at the same crank angle, and I average them, I will find 1200 K. But as you see right away, there is a big difference between averages and instantaneous cycles. So why is it important? Well, again, uh, the mean, that, that's a Berkeley, Berkeley, you know, joke saying the, the mean doesn't mean anything, okay? Uh, it doesn't work in French, but it works well in English. Uh, why doesn't it mean anything? Because if I send you to a place somewhere in the world, I tell you temperature is, average temperature is 18 degrees, you know, you can say, oh, it's a nice place to live, okay? Because basically temperature is 20 in the summer and 16 in the winter. So you will like it, but you know, there are other signals which have the same average. This one also have an average of 18, you know, just that it's 50 in the summer and minus 20 in the winter. And so it's not so pleasant, okay? So that proves that the mean doesn't mean anything. You need to know about the perturbations. And it's the same for a flame. If you have only the mean temperature, it doesn't tell you much about what's really happening in this flame. The best example is that could be the temperature uh, at the outlet of a combustion chamber. And you are sitting on the turbine, and on the turbine you know that the metal will melt at this temperature. You see that the mean temperature may be less than that, but there will be moments where it will be higher than that. And so if you look at the mean, you will say, I'm safe. If you look at the perturbation, you will see that you're not safe. And so knowing the mean is, in general, not enough. You need to know more than the mean. And that's why we started doing larger dissimulations. So if you look at the, the, the market today of commercial codes, most of them are actually working with ones. Okay. And the problem is not only they produce the mean value, but that's very difficult to compute the mean value. You need models. And these models change everything. And we will describe them tomorrow. Uh, and uh, the reliability and the precision today of ones models is usually insufficient for what we want to do for future engines especially for your generation. If you want to be precise, if you want to predict quenching, ignition, the mean cannot be used. For example, if you compute an ignition, what does the mean mean? Again, because it's cold initially, then at the end it's warm. So are you going to average that? I mean, it doesn't mean much. So then maybe 30 years ago, again, there was another class of people, and you can recognize them. You will find them in, in, in France at a few places, England and Stanford, people doing DNS. Okay. So DNS, those were people saying, we want to do direct mechanical simulations. We don't want any model. So you can do that. This is an example of simulation, but that's a, an old one. But today, you can get better than, than that, where there is absolutely no model. So we compute every detail of the flow, including with complex chemistry. The only detail here is that we can do a box of only 0.1 millimeter which is not extremely useful uh, uh, for in practice. And so this is why actually probably 25 years ago, the community was split in two, um, the ones people on one side and the DNS people on the other side. So the DNS people kept saying, you cannot only rely on the mean. And I just want here to give you an example or, or two. This is an example of a turbulent diffusion burner where you inject fuel here and air on the side here. And this engine, uh, you can look uh, on the side, from the side, on the, on the results, and you can compute and compare to experiments the mean temperature field, for example. So you see th this is the mean, so it doesn't move. And you see that it's cold here and it's warm here, so it looks like a flame. But again, when you look at this picture, you don't understand half of the problem because this is now a LES of the same flow, and this is what the temperature field looks like. And you see that when you look at an LES, you, you have a completely different picture. If you would average this picture, you would find the previous one. 
But here you can see many more things. You see that there are excursions of temperature, you see big vortices, etc. And today we cannot rely only on the mean values if we want to predict uh, gas turbine combustion. Now, engines are even worse. Engines are pretty strange animals uh, because each cycle uh, apparently can forget what happened in the previous cycle. So this is a, a view here of a measurement, so it's not a simulation. They took many cycles, and at the same crank angle, they averaged them, and they get this picture. They get here what we call swirl, again, so that means the flow on the mean is turning like this. But if you look at one cycle, uh, it doesn't look at all like this one, okay? The, so these things don't look the same, and that, that's another cycle, it doesn't look like any of those. So the mean probably doesn't even exist anywhere. You would not find one cycle which looks like the mean. So how can you use it to predict anything? Okay? So that's a major problem. You know? And we've been doing it for a long time. Huh? But uh, still, uh, from a fundamental point of view, uh, the mean in, a, in an engine like this is just not meaningful. Um, so those are examples, actually, of measurements. Although this one is actually an LES, where you look at cycles, and you see that they're supposed to be all the same. Uh, it's the same crank angle, but uh, none of them looks the same, which makes sense. I mean, we expect that. So we started doing larger dissimulation that probably met more than 15 years ago now uh, of engine combustion uh, using larger dissimulation and not once. So we don't average over cycles. We compute cycle after cycle. Okay. Of course, this is much more expensive. Instead of computing one cycle, you have to compute 20, 50. And you see here an example of LES without combustion. This is a motored engine, so there is no uh, reaction in that case. And I will show you a case with, uh, with combustion now. And of course, you, you recognize it's an LES, you see, because you see vortices. It looks like a real flow. If you would look at this with a once code, you would see like a jelly here, a very viscous flow, which would be supposedly the mean of all cycles, which doesn't, again, uh, it's difficult to, 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 to analyze. So this is the same flow now with combustion. So you get the intake here. So the valve is open. You inject the premix gases. We go to uh, bottom position. Then we compress. The spark is located here. There is a model for the spark and a model for the combustion in large dissimulation. You will see the combustion starting here at the spark. You see how it's very late in the cycle right now, you get combustion. And then you get exhaust now, the exhaust valve will open. And then you go to the next cycle. Okay, the PhD students who do that, they have fun, believe me, because the problem is not combustion, it's really computer science. This is all moving mesh, as you can see, so it's, it's, it's complicated. So uh, now this, uh, this point when you do multiple cycles is that even in the simulation, all the cycles are different, as expected. You see here, for example, there is a, a, a fast cycle here, there is a slow cycle uh, here, and uh, they all should be the same, because they are the same crank angle, but they are not the same. This is the reaction rate, by the way. So you see, for example, cycle two is almost finished, while some others are not. And when you put all the pressure curves in a diagram like this one, this is crank angle and this is pressure, this is the maximum pressure seen in the experiment, the minimum pressure, this is the average pressure, and the LES cycles you know, are distributed all over the place here. So you are explicitly resolving the randomness of the flow when you do LES. Okay. But of course the cost is amazingly larger than what you would find with ones. Uh, by the way, uh, this looks a little bit uh, remote to you, but you have cycle-to-cycle uh, -cycle variations too. Your heart is doing exactly that. This is the average cycle in a heart, and those are instantaneous cycles. And if you look at the two, you will see that, as expected, in the average cycle, everything is smooth, you know. Uh, again, remember that this never, you never have that in your heart, okay? Uh, because the average doesn't mean anything, but still, this is what doctors are using today when we do simulations. But when you look at instantaneous cycles, from time to time, one of them is much more violent than the average. And the doctors will tell you that what's important is not the average cycle, it's the extreme events in those cycles because those are the ones hurting you and uh, having structural effects. So this question of average versus uh, resolution of instantaneous cycles is not a detail, okay? It's a very important philosophical problem that you want to go into to that, you know, especially you. I mean, you know, 20 years ago, it was okay to do that, but today, 
you have to go to, to at least LES. OK, so the idea is that uh, we, a few years ago, we had the choice between bad runs on the real engine or good uh, DNS, but in a very small domain. You know, we could not compute the whole engine. And so what you will do now in your generation, is you have to go to LES to combine the two. So we will want DNS accuracy by computing the, at least the large eddies. And we will want to be able to do that in real configurations, okay, in real engines. And that's the difficult thing that we, that we need to do. And the, this is one of the most, uh, let's say, the central things that we're going to discuss uh, during this course. So let, let me go a little bit uh, in, uh, into uh, the dirty details now uh, that most of you know. I think uh, Moshe described them this morning, just to remind you that we talk here about uh, fuels, which can be gas or liquid, and we're going to burn them with either air or oxygen. I just want to say that this is a partial view of combustion. Okay, in many combustion devices, you don't burn gases, you burn uh, liquids. I will not talk about that. And in many cases, you even burn solids. If you do bombs or solid propellants. Uh, but again, you cannot hope to understand those things if you don't understand first the gaseous flames, okay? because those are clean problems, while the others here are not so clean. Uh, let me just remind you what uh, stoichiometry means. You call Stoichiometry is the amount of air you need to burn one gram of fuels. And you can compute that uh, by writing this relation here in moles. And you compute the stoichiometric ratio. You say it's B, the coefficient here, multiplied by the molecular weight of B, divided by A, divided by the molecular, the molecular weight of A. And this gives you the number of grams of B needed to burn one gram of A, stoichiometry. So if you look at that for uh, oxygen, for hydrogen, you find eight. If you want to burn one gram of hydrogen, you need eight grams of oxygen. Okay, stoichiometry, you're doing combustion, you know what that is. Uh, the, the most important quantity here for combustion is equivalence ratio. At every point in the flow, you are preparing the mixing. So you know what should be the field of equivalence ratio. It's YA over YB divided by YA over YB at stoichiometry, which is SYA over YB, where S is the stoichiometric ratio. And when this thing is equal to one, you are stoichiometry. After combustion, you will have no A and no B. Everything should be gone. If you have phi less than unity, we say that you are lean. You will have oxygen left. If you have phi more than unity, combustion is rich, and you are wasting fuel because there's some fuel left in the burn gases. No one does that anymore. Okay? My motorcycle was still doing it a few years ago. They were working at 1.1. Today, you need a carburetor to do that. Okay? Today, with injection systems, no one works at rich conditions. Okay. Now, uh, Moshe presented that this morning. This is the, uh, the, the, the basic relation by Arrhenius telling you how fast a reaction takes place. And I will not go into the details. You've seen that this morning. Why A is the mass fraction of A, why B the mass fraction of B, and T is the temperature. In this system, A, new A, new B, and TA are constant. They are given by the chemist, the famous chemist I described at the beginning of this talk. You know. This is their job. They give us this constant. And then in our codes, we know why A, why B, and T, so we can compute the reaction rate. There is an important thing about this reaction rate. I would like you to realize that right away is that it takes three things to burn. Why? You must have A and B and T at the same place. If you have only A and B and no hotspot, you're fine. Okay? So this is really a specificity of combustion that you need three ingredients to burn in general. And that conditions the, what we call the flame regimes. So this was also mentioned this morning uh, in the real world of chemists. Uh, global reactions never occur. So for example, if you talk about H2 plus one half O2 gives H2O, that never happens. There is no individual reaction where H2 meets O2 to make water. When H2 meets O2, you find OH, and then OH later meets H2 to produce H2O plus H, etc. So you need to go at what we call individual reactions. So for a chemist, there's a big, very big difference. Those are individual reactions. That means they exist in the real world. Okay? While H2 plus one half O2 gives H2O is what you call a global reaction. It's an imagination of the global process, but it doesn't correspond to any real reactions. 
Now, these reactions are tabulated. This is, we are very fortunate that, that, at least for this case, all the chemists in the world, following actually Sandia at that time, uh, are using the same format, which we call the Kemkin format. And the Kemkin format gives you A for this reaction. Then it gives you the beta. I miss a term here. There's a T to the power beta. That's this constant. And the last value here is the activation energy. So if you want to scheme for any fuel, you go on the web, you type, and someone will give you the Kemkin format for this thing. Except that here, this is for hydrogen. There's only about 20-something reactions. If you want it for kerosene, it will not fit on this slide, okay? It will be thousands of reactions, so you cannot do it. So this is complex chemistry. And again, we try to avoid that, but there are cases where you can't. Now, as we mentioned already, this is a nonlinear equation, and that's going to be a pain. There will be a lot of consequences. I'll come back to that later. But mathematically, integrating this thing is always going to be difficult. Uh, as I said before, uh, the specificity of this form here is that at low temperature, you know, Ta is high. It's something like 2,000, 5,000, 10,000. So if you have 10,000 divided by 300, it's exponential minus 30, it's zero. So at low temperatures, this term quenches everything. There is no reaction at low temperature, but you know that. Okay? Combustion doesn't occur alone. If you mix, again, air with gas in this room, nothing will happen. If there, no one is smoking or no one does something stupid, you could stay here. It's, not, it's, it's safe, relatively safe. But if temperature goes up, then suddenly this exponential does what the exponentials do. You know, It gets crazy, and then uh, it will go up, and then, of course, then the chemical reaction rates will start, and they will be violent. So mathematically, we expect difficulties. The other problem is now, the, Moshe mentioned that this morning, but not, didn't go to the end. He will do that tomorrow. Is that everything happens in flames in thin zones. In other words, we said we have, uh, for example, CH4 plus O2 here, which will go to CO2 and whatever in the burn gases. This will take place in the flame front in the zone, which is very thin. Let's say the order of magnitude is 0.5 millimeter. So everything of interest will actually be finished here in a zone which has a thickness of you know, a, few, a, few, a few microns. So if you think now about CFD, say, oh, oh wait a second. If, if the front here is like half a millimeter and I want to resolve it, I need to put at least 10 or 20 points there. So the mesh size is going to be 50 microns. And again, we are back to the problem that if the engine is one meter and I have a mesh of 50 microns, it's the end of the day again. So that will make our life miserable, OK? Uh, if, the, if the flame fonts would be large, I mean, it would be easy, but not for combustion. Uh, you got here the famous guys, huh? uh, Zeldovich, uh, Williams, and Clavin. Those two guys are still alive. But Zeldovich is dead. He's, a, he was, uh, he's probably the most famous uh, scientist. Just have to know that uh, he's famous and he's pretty good in combustion because he was actually designing the nuclear uh, bomb of the Russians. And, uh, the, the phenomena in the nuclear bomb are very connected to the phenomena in flames. This is why he was doing so, so many flames. But he was a brilliant uh, guy. I didn't, met, I didn't meet him, but uh, Clever uh, met him, and he was, he was the hero of, of this generation. So just to look at the very simple flame, the Bunsen flame, if you are smoking, OK, you know that. That's what you have on top of your lighter. The question here, you have fresh gases. They're burnt. Here they are burnt. And if you go. If you look here at this zone, if you would cut here, the question is, what is the structure of this flame font? What is its speed? Does it have a speed? And uh, what is the thickness of that? And here, this is where theoreticians get you know, useful. And Moshe will show you how to do that. I will repeat it with a different method. You need to understand uh, how the flames propagate, first in a, in a laminar flow, and then we'll do it in a turbulent flow. Now, at this point, and again, Moshe will come back to that, it's necessary to mention that uh, combustion is an interesting thing where you can have multiple solutions for one problem. I will show you examples of turbulent flames which have multiple solutions for one case. But even for, for a laminar flame, you can have at least three solutions. Uh, this is uh, an example where you have here a tube, for example, where you, which you fill with gas and, let's, do, let's see, for hydrogen and oxygen. And it's still, nothing is happening. And you wonder, how many solutions can I have to this problem if I ignite one side of it? 
So if I put burn cases here, what can be the structure of this thing? Well, the first thing is that it could not ignite. That means everything would cool down, go back to cold gases everywhere. That's solution number one. There is a second solution where you would have a laminar flame propagating at subsonic speed, 50 centimeters per second maximum. That's what we call a deflagration. Or there's a second solution where you could go to a detonation where the front here would propagate at two kilometers per second and the pressure on both sides would be extremely different. Uh, you can study that. It's an amazingly simple thing to do. I may, I may do it actually maybe this week. I want to see if Moshe does it or not. This is why I need to sit in his class. Uh, you can just by uh, writing uh, jump conditions. Those of you who have, who have done shock waves uh, in non-reacting flows know about that. You write a conservation of mass, momentum, and energy between the two sides, and you can prove easily that there are indeed two solutions. And uh, the way to do that is quite simple. You have uh, one state here, another state here, you write the conservation, and you can prove that uh, you have at least two classes of solution. If you put here the ratio of densities between fresh and burnt, and here the ratio of pressure between burnt and fresh, you have one solution where pressure changes a lot, that's the detonation, and one solution where the pressure is almost constant between the fresh and the burn, that's a deflagration. In the real world, most journalists get confused about deflagration and detonation. Okay? Uh, they, they say there was a big deflagration that everyone heard. No, you don't hear deflagrations. Deflagrations are quiet. They don't do noise. If you hear boom, it's a detonation. If you hear bomb, it's a detonation. Because it is associated to a big difference in pressure. So to, to make it simple for you, you can keep in your head that there are two solutions. Here you get deflagrations where pressure on both sides is the same and SL is very small compared to the sound speed. The sound speed is the reference here because that, com that measures compressibility. So here SL will be half a meter per second. C0 is 300 meters per second. So the Mach number of a deflagration is 0.001 or something. It's very small. No compressibility, constant pressure. So this is a flame. Detonation is uh, a flame plus a shock. That means here that the speed at which the detonation is moving is much more than one. Uh, if we derive the theory in, in, two, in, the, in a few days, you will see that this number is of the order of five to six. Okay. The, the detonation moves in the fresh gases at a max number of six. So if you take uh, air, 300 meters per second multiplied by six equals two kilometers per second. And the pressure jump will be enormous between both sides. You will have one bar in the fresh and maybe 20 or 30 in the burnt. And of course, now, if you have a wave at 20 bar arriving on you or on the building, it's the end of the day, okay? It's, uh, this is why we use that in the weapon. Uh, all bombs produce uh, detonations. The detonations are uh, normally not really useful, but uh, some people try to use them. Uh, you can use them, for example, in what we call a propagating detonation engine. I will show you a movie here. So the idea is simple. You, you are, it's like a cyclic engine. So you start the cycle by mixing fuel and air. You ignite it as a detonation with a special system. You have a detonation propagating, and then you reload it, and you start it again. Okay? And this is a view, actually. I need some sound here because it's a fun one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, where you will, you will hear and see a detonation engine. This is a propagating detonation engine. So you see the chamber on the left here. Every beep, 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 beep was a detonation, okay? So we had the detonation, we refilled, and we started again. People didn't like that too much because it's an unsteady engine. Now comes a very uh, exciting uh, concept, uh, which probably is one way to increase the efficiency of gas turbines and of many other systems. It's what we call the rotating detonation engine. So the rotating detonation engine is a crazy engine. You take a normal engine and you replace the injection here by just a tube in which you inject, for example, hydrogen, and you build this thing so that you can have a turning detonation in the system. And this thing works already. Huh? There, there are quite a few engines working. So, at the beginning, it's kind of difficult to visualize. Let me show you uh, uh, an animation of that because you can compute this thing. So you see here, you have holes at the bottom where you inject fuel. Here you have a detonation, and this detonation eats 
the fresh gases, and by the time the detonation comes back, there is more fresh gases which have been injected. And the detonation turns at two kilometers per second in this system. And the efficiency of that is extremely high because combustion proceeds so fast that it leads to very high efficiency. And uh, so you see here, this is the fresh gases. You see that be behind the detonation there is none, but then there is a re-injection, and by the time this thing comes back, it can turn around. So it's like the PDE, like the propagating detonation engine, except that you don't need to refill every time. The refill just comes from the fact that this thing goes around and around. And the frequency of rotation for an engine like this, about 5,000 hertz, and the, en the, the engine turns at two kilometers per second. So we, we think that an engine like this could fly in maybe 20 years, okay? That's about it for the moment. There are already engines uh, on, in the labs, but to make it operate, it's a bit complicated uh, because of the pressure. But the main issue with detonation is not to build these engines. The main issue is that we do detonations when we don't want them. And uh, the most famous examples, of course, is uh, uh, buildings and leaks. So wh what's the topic here? You know that um, one of the main problems for safety in many places, in buildings, but also on uh, uh, oil platforms, is that if you look at the number of veins that you have everywhere, multiplied by the probability that you have a leak, you almost know that there's always a leak somewhere. So something is leaking. What, what's leaking? It's leaking gas. So the gas goes up and mixed with the air, you know, every day, somewhere. It's true on oil platforms, it's true in mines. In mines, you don't even need a leak because uh, the, the, the earth the, itself produces methane in addition to coal, you know, if you're digging coal. You have methane and then at some point, you can have ignition. So what happens if you have ignition? This is a movie by the Lloyd company, it's an insurance company. Why are they involved? Because these accidents kill people. So then insurance comes into the business. So they want to study that. This is a long tube, it's not a tube, it's a building actually. Uh, 30 meters, uh, it's, uh, there's a, a small a sheet of uh, plastic around it, and they mix air and gas, and it's steady. And then they ignite it at one end, and they look at what's happening. So the first thing I want to show you is what we call a deflagration. It's a fast deflagration. You don't want to be there, but uh, it's still deflagration. So if you listen to the noise and look at the movie, we ignite on the left. Reasonably be quiet. So we call that a good flame because everyone is dead, <laughs> but the building is still here. The reason the building is still here is that the pressure generated by combustion is low, a few hundreds of pascal, maybe 0.1 bar or something, and the, the walls can resist. The walls of this room would resist, you know, half a bar, maybe something like this. Half a, half a bar, you know, multiplied by the surface is a lot of force. Huh? But uh, then uh, if you take the same type of building and you do exactly the same thing. Now this is a detonation, okay? So what's the difference? The only thing that's different is that here they added a small wall at the beginning of the chamber for the first two meters. And that's enough for the flame to go from a deflagration to a detonation. And you see it's a detonation because at the end there is nothing left, okay? And so the reason why people care so much about detonation is that we don't want them to happen. And uh, so this is where we need to predict that. And uh, when detonation happens, uh, wherever it happens, you know, it's always bad. In an engine, for example, if you have a detonation, in one cycle you get a hole in the engine because the pressure goes to crazy values. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, you would like to be sure that uh, you can avoid these things. In most cases, we try to stick to deflagration. So in a gas turbine, we have deflagration, and we, in a, in a piston engine too, most flames are in the deflagration regime, and we would like to stay there. And during this course, we will not discuss detonation too much, again, because normally uh, it shouldn't be there. But I want to show you a few things. The first thing which is a problem is that many flames begin as deflagration and can go to detonation. That's called DDT, deflagration, detonation, transition. And that's a fun problem, except that it's not fun when it happens, 
But that's a fun problem to study, and many, many groups actually today are looking at the problem. One of the reasons that people get more and more interested is that deflagration, detonation, transition occurs especially for hydrogen. Hmm. And hydrogen is the big topic today, as you know. So uh, we, are, we are quite afraid uh, that uh, we'll hear, and that's the case, uh, more and more of DDT uh, for H2. So let me show you an example of simulation that you get a feeling of what the detonation is. That's an experiment in Munich uh, where they can study deflagration and detonation. So that's a tube, quite simple. You put air into it and you put also uh, hydrogen. And depending on how much hydrogen and air you put there, you will have different results. So the first thing I want to show you is a case which is here where you don't put too much hydrogen, you know, like 15% in volume, and then you ignite here. And you look at the propagation of the flame. Now, for certain cases, uh, this propagation is what we call uh, rather nice. The flame is ignited here, and you see here, this thing is actually connected to this point. This point is connected to this one. So this is the, the tube in four pieces, but it's only one tube. And here you see the pressure. You see the gradient of pressure, actually. At the initial times, it's just a love in the flames that we will describe tomorrow. And it's propagating slowly, a few meters per second. But then when it gets wrinkled here by the obstacles, there is more turbulence in front of it. And every time it meets more and more turbulence, the flame accelerates. So it will uh, go faster, not very fast, a few meters per second, maybe 10, 20 meters per second. Uh, but not too bad, and the, the pressure gradients will remain reasonably small. There will be a shock wave propagating here, but not interacting with the flame, and so we'll be, let's say, in the deflagration regime for this case. Now, you see the nice thing about the simulation. You see, for example, for the moment, the flow going backwards because there's this pressure wave coming back. Large D simulation captures all that, makes nice movies. So the, the, the PhD students are usually happy with that. So, then you move to another case and you say, okay, uh, this is the comparison, I will jump that. Uh, let's put more hydrogen. So instead of being here, let's go to a case where we have more hydrogen. Now things get much more faster. I mean, uh, here when you do that, we'll have a, a movie here where we move with the flame. So you see the flame starts here and the window of observation will actually move with the flame. So, Pretty soon, we'll see the first obstacle appearing here. That's this guy. And then we'll see another one, etc. That's the first obstacle. You see the flame that gets more and more wrinkled. When the flame passes here, you get more and more surface. And you see the surface keeps increasing until we meet the second obstacle. Then in front of the flame, the blast effect, which I will describe later, creates more and more turbulence. And then at some point, you have here the obstacle. Here you have the flame front. And now, you start seeing shockwave. This is the pressure or the density. And the flame will actually lock with the acoustic wave. When this will happen, this will be detonation. The detonation will start, you will see it. It will start in this zone here. We, it's kind of difficult to analyze. But we know it's due to the interaction of a shockwave with uh, this flame here. So pretty soon it will go. You can see here temperature going up. And now. You see here this front, that's a detonation front. Pretty soon it will invade the whole chamber, and then after that, the detonation starts. So you see that uh, in the same chamber, just by putting a little bit more of hydrogen can take you to detonation. And again, that's going to be a big topic when we go to hydrogen everywhere, which we will, uh, if we have leaks, and we will have leaks, uh, safety will become a, a big issue. Now, the other thing uh, that we need to discuss now is instabilities. Uh, not so more acoustics, not the one I've shown before, but the fact that uh, Moshe will give you a big course on planar flames. Planar flames do not really exist in the real world. Most flames are not planar. They do funny things, uh, which is good, again, for theoretical studies, but uh, it's not so nice in practice. So normally we would like, uh, for example, a detonation or a deflagration to have a planar structure just like a sheet, you know, moving in one direction. But that does not really happen. You know, most de detonations do not have a planar structure. They have this kind of structure here. I will show a movie of that in a second. 
and uh, deflagration, many of them start planar, but actually they start developing structures. So combustion is nice, uh, and the mathematicians, Zeldovich, Clavin, Williams, all these guys, they love them because they do all these things. They do all kinds of instability, so they are quite interesting. In practice, it's not so interesting. It makes our life miserable, but uh, uh, for mathematicians, they like it. So this is an example of a detonation propagating left here. And you will see that this, those structures are moving. You have what you call triple points here. And you see what, how deflagration really, a detonation really propagates. So you see that now, uh, right away, it gets more complicated. Huh? But th this is all detonation do that, so you have no choice. OK, let me move to flame regimes now. Uh, I told you we need three people to make a flame, A, B, and temperature. So if you look at the global picture, you need fuel, oxidizer, and temperature. You can simplify your life by, for example, mixing fuel and air right away. That's what you call a premix flame. So that means you eliminate the problem of mixing of A and B, you put them together. That's what you call a premix flame. And in the lab, we know we, 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 we can do it, and we, we like to do that numerically because it's a clean problem. Uh, we can also have the op other opposite situation. You don't want to mix A and B for security reasons, for example. You want to inject A and B and burn at the same time. That's what we call non premix flames or diffusion flames. These two types of flames are quite different, uh, and uh, um, we need to say a few words about that. So the first thing about premix flames. Premix flames, remember, when you mix A and B, you can decide them to, you can decide to mix them in any proportion. You decide, OK? I decide, for example, I want to do a stoichiometric mixture. So I'm going to take one gram of H2, eight gram of O2, mix them. But I might take something else. OK, I put less fuel, less oxidizer. So if I'm working here with phi equal one, we say with stoichiometric, here we are rich, here we are lean. Remember that lean flames are usually clean flames. Easy to remember, huh? lean, clean, it's a good one. And uh, rich flames are dirty because you get too much fuel, you get CO, as I said, can kill you. You get unburned hydrocarbons, you get everything you want. So you don't want to be rich at least for flames. So there is a second problem with uh, premix flames. That's what we call flammability limits. If you put a little bit of fuel in this room and you smoke or you switch a light or you put a spark, it will not burn. It will not ignite. If you are too lean, if you are below what we call the lean flammability limit, there is no flame. And now surprisingly, people are surprised, but normally it's symmetric. It's the same here. If you put too much gas in this room, there will not be enough oxygen, and it's the same thing. You will not be able to ignite it. And for most fuels here, you go from the lean flammability limit is around 0.5, and the rich flammability limit around 3. And these things change with temperature. If you get warmer, this flammability limit extends. And if you take hydrogen, the flammability limits are enormous. For hydrogen, you know, it ignites almost all the time. So it's a bad, uh, it's a bad example for, for safety. And combustion. Normally, you know, you can have uh, gas turbines operating in a lean condition or in a rich condition, and you can have all kinds of, you know, uh, possibilities. But normally, more and more, we want to go to lean combustion. The problem is that when you go to lean combustion, as I said before, uh, you have to play games because many of these flames become unstable, and then you have to find a compromise. So what you need to remember is that the premix flames are the most efficient, flamed, they are the cleanest, but they're also the most dangerous. Why are they dangerous? Well, if you have an H2O2 mixture, it just needs a spark, and then it will go and burn. So it's, it's called a bomb, and no one wants to travel with a mixture of fuel and air. It's too dangerous. So you want to store things separately, you know, not together. Even if it would be more efficient from a safety point of view, there is no discussion. No one wants to travel with these things premixed. So we want to actually store things in a diffusion mode and then burn them in a premix mode, and I'm coming back to mixing. It means we should be able to mix things fast. We should be able to take uh, fuel and inject it as fast as we can to mix. If you take just a, a Bunsen flame, that's a tube here, uh, if you just have fuel coming out, this is a view of a diffusion flame. Okay? Diffusion flames are long because they burn slowly. They are lazy. If you blow on them, you say they move. They are yellow because they produce soot, okay? And soot is not yellow except when it's hot. Soot is black. Remember that? You know, you're commercial guys. Huh? Uh, 
And if you go on the other side here, if you inject air and gas here, you get a yellow flame. That's a good flame. That's a premix flame. It's uh, intense, short, and it doesn't pollute too much. And that's the flame we'd like to have. So at the end of the day, we would like to burn in a premix mode, but we don't want to premix things, so we have a problem. The only way to do that is to use fast mixers. That means we mix at the last moment, and the key word there is swirl. Swirl is the way to produce uh, fast mixing. So let me show you uh, a few uh, other crazy, I don't know if these guys are paid to do that, but that's, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting how they do it. So swirl is this idea that <clears throat> instead of just blowing your fuel into the air, you are swirling the flow, and the rotation will change completely the mixing. Why? Well, because when you have a jet which is rotating, you create a recirculation zone on the axis where things have much more time to mix. So, swirl. This is swirl you can do at home. One way to do swirl is to take a cylinder like that and to cut it and to push one side compared to the other so that the air has to come this way when it enters the system. So this guy will explain it to you. ...into a fire tornado. Pretty much all you need is like some kind of rubbing alcohol or flammable fluid like lighter fluid and something to hold it in. I'm going to be using one of these little tea light candle holders. Take some of your fuel and you pour it in. Okay, so there's a rubbing alcohol flame and notice it kind of has just like a yellow lazy flame going on. But watch what happens when we put the vase over it. So at first we'll put it right over it and nothing really interesting happens. It's still a lazy flame. But watch what happens when we offset the glass cylinders a little bit. It instantly spins up into a fire tornado, and that's pretty cool. So basically what's happening here is the air is coming in through either side, and it's spinning around on the inside of the glass, pulling the fire upwards. And actually, that can give you pretty good visualization. Let me get some methanol, which burns clear. All right, so I've got a little bit of methanol on fire here, and you can't really see it because it burns with an invisible flame, but when I bring the smoke close, you can tell that it gets caught in the convection currents. So if we take these and we put it on here like this, you'll see the smoke gets drawn in there. And now you can visualize the convection currents that are going on inside of here. Oh, I forgot, I guess I colored that flame a little bit red. Which reminds me, there's a bunch of really cool things you can do with this. By putting these smoldering fire starters on the inside of the glass, it created a neat smoke tornado. This is the way we mix, okay? Because of that this rotation. That is so cool. Check this out, we can color so this guy is a, a, an amateur. Let me show you the real guys now. <laughs> this is serious. All right, I'm ready on a uh, phantom. Here we go. Yeah, that's lit. Okay, just let it build up. So the, 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 the oh. ventilators have an angle so that they induce swirl also, and you will see the effect on the, on the main flame here. And you will see that go this rotation yep. changes everything. It increases mixing and it makes flames which are very different. Liquid fuel. Oh, oh yeah. sweet. So you see the swirl like foot, eh? shape of the vehicle. <laughs> they are selling high speed cameras. Okay, that's why they do the fluid. But you see here a very good example of a swirl flame, okay? You see the flame turning. And because of the swirl, it's much more compact and much more hard. <laughs> I think there's a ratio of uh, 1,000 between the two experiments you've seen. Okay, that's a, this, this, is, this camera has cost like $200,000. Uh, so now in the lab, everyone has a swirler today. I mean, everyone is swirling is their flames. And you can even have systems like this one here. The swirler design depends on every company. This is the lab here in uh, Ecole Centrale in Paris. And I just want to show you what happens when you change the swirl. So they have a system where they can change the angle of the veins here so that you have adjustable swirl. And when you do that, you see that the flame is not the same. When you have a small swirl, the flame is long. And when you increase the swirl, the flame gets shorter. So you can bring it to a very small size because you increase the mixing, it burns faster than when you have no swirl. This is why most flames today are swirled. Now, there are many ways to do that. 
and you don't want to push it too much because there are other problems, but swirl frames are everywhere because they help to mix, which is very important for, for, for us. Okay, um, I'm going to, 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 to finish this part today uh, by talking a little bit about uh, classification, especially if you do CFD. We talked about premix frame and non-premix frame, premix frames and diffusion frames. If you do a simulation, you don't really care about that. Uh, what's more important for you is what I'm going to say now. Either you do unconfined flames or you do confined flames. So what is unconfined? It's a flame burning in the atmosphere. Confined, it's a flame burning in a combustion chamber. Uh, in practice, uh, if you want to, uh, to do a useful flame, it has to be burning in a chamber. If you want to recover heat or power, you, have, you, you need to put it in a chamber. It's burning in the free atmosphere, except for light. There's not much you can recover. But if you do an experimental uh, campaign in your lab, many of us are actually using unconfined flames just because they are easier to study, with at least, for example, for optical diagnostics. But if you do CFD, you might say, well, what's the difference? Well, there's a big difference. It's actually two different types of codes. Why is it different? Well, for example, if you do a, a non-confined flame, you don't care too much about uh, the effects of dilatation. Well, if you do a confined flame, the, f the flow will accelerate because of the density change and because there are walls there. So the, the effects of dilatation will be important. And of course, if the flame is confined, we need to worry about the walls. Again, we go back to the problem of heat transfer at the walls. You will need to do something. When the flame is confined, acoustic waves might become a problem. I will show you an example. We talked about combustion stability. You will have acoustic waves bouncing in all directions, maybe interacting with the flame, and that will be a problem that we will discuss uh, in, a few day, in a few days. And then finally, uh, and that's a, not a detail. I mean, it's a detail for the professor. It's not a detail for the student. Uh, if you need to mesh here a swirler uh, on a structured mesh, uh, believe me, it's going to be fun. There are ways to do that. There are a few codes which do it, but uh, just the mesh generation for a geometry like this one is going to be a major problem. So that, uh, in practice, the world is split in two. A lot of people doing DNS, or let's say simple computation, they use IJK mesh, okay? We call them shoebox, you know, rectangles, where if you are sitting here and I'm at point IJK, I know that my neighbor on the right is I plus one, JK, my neighbor on the left is I minus one. Okay, it's very simple topology. If you do a real geometry like this one, you use unstructured mesh. And here, if you want to know the neighbor of this node, well, you have to go to a table to know what's the neighbor. I mean, it's a complicated story, it's unstructured mesh. And the generation, of course, is more complicated. But if you want to do a complicated geometry, you have to go to unstructured meshes. Now, to be completely fair, there are methods today where you can mesh a geometry like this on a mesh like this by using uh, blanking, by using all kinds of methods. Uh, that's what uh, Converge is doing with this cut and sell method. That's what uh, uh, LBM methods are doing too. So there is today an intermediate way to do that. But whatever you do, you have to remember that if the geometry gets complicated, your life will get complicated too. And, uh, there's absolutely no doubt on that. So if you do unconfined flames, in shoeboxes, uh, that's what you do when you do DNS. So this is a rectangle. You can solve everything within it, and you can do it in 3D. This is an ignition, for example. You can even do Bunsen burners like those here. This is still reasonable. And you can you know, use an IJK mesh, and uh, that should be more or less OK. okay? But if you go to this flow, and that's a swirl burner with a combustion chamber, then you need a more complicated setup to be able to mesh and generate the mesh for this guy. So during this course, um, I will come back to the problem of the numerical method, which is essential. Uh, and we'll need to discuss also the models for turbulent combustion. We'll talk about the codes. And uh, <clears throat> the first thing we need to do is to uh, go back to the equations. That's what we will do tomorrow and uh, go back to turbulent combustion models. The equations, I will uh, probably be a little bit more precise than, uh, than Moshe because I want you to know which equations you solve if you take a CFD code. And for combustion, you will see that it's easy to, 
to make mistakes here. And then uh, we'll need to talk about laminar flames. Um, I will also discuss something that people call uh, complexities, and I want to finish with that before we, we take a break here. Everyone doing combustion talks about complexities. Everything is complex, OK? Uh, the first thing which is complex is chemistry. We talk all the time about complex chemical schemes. But there are odd, other ways to be complicated. So let me, let me show you which kind of complexity we really discuss when we talk about uh, combustion simulations. And if you do a PhD on CFD of flames, you should, you should know where you are, because it's, you're going to see that there are different complexities. So you can do a PhD where you compute laminar flames. Okay. It's complicated. It's complex because you have complex chemistry. If it's a CH4 air flame, you need to take a, a scheme, for example, the San Diego scheme, which has already you know, 25 species, 50 reactions. So it's going to be complicated. So somehow it is complicated. But you know, what I call complicated is this guy here. That's complicated. Because you get the same chemistry, you're also burning methane, you'll get exactly the same problems. You still have complex chemistry. But then here you get everything at the same time. The flow is complicated, it is turbulent, you get heat transfer, the wall, you get acoustics, you get whatever you want. So all of that is complicated. So you have to know how complicated is your PhD going to be. Well, let's start from you know, talking about codes from growing complexity. The first thing that you can do when you do a PhD in combustion is to do what we call auto-ignition computation, zero-dimensional computation. You take a box, which is homogeneous, you fill it with air and gas at temperature T, and you compute it versus time. Uh, the equations that you solve is only rho CP dt dt equal reaction rate, and uh, d rho y k dt equal the reaction rate of species k. Okay. And this can be done by a lot of code. I mean, there are Kemkin does that, Cantera does it, Cosilab, whatever. And even you can write a code to do that. It's just a simple equation, okay? And uh, here, when you do that, you can know about kinetics and thermochemistry. Thermochemistry is a big word for, you need the tables for enthalpy, basically, and that's it. And uh, so to do that, you need very few ingredients, and all the kinetics community I described before, they know how to do that, and they know how to do that only. That's the only thing they know how to do, actually. There's no kinetics expert who could say. Yeah. And that means, for example, that those guys never compute a flame. Okay? They compute what you see here. They compute auto-ignition time. They tell you if temperature is low, it will take one hour to ignite. If temperature is high, it will take one millisecond, one microsecond. And they plot things like this. 1,000 over T, over T. There are reasons why it's 1,000 over T. But let's say, so here, uh, you get high temperatures and low ignition times. And here, it's the other way. <clears throat> And when you plot those things, you get a very good indication of the quality of your chemical scheme. Okay? And this is, uh, you can also measure it in shock tubes, and you can compare, compare the two, and you can qualify your chemical scheme. So that's already complicated. But here, when you do that, you can use 10,000 reactions, because you know, what you are solving is extremely simple. So you can put a lot of complicated chemistry when you do that. Now, the problem is that this is not a flame. This is a, a, an imaginary model of a, of a homogeneous reactor, you know, PSR, or WSR, whatever it's called in, in Chemkin or Cantera. We ma you have to, re to, to realize that those people actually never compute a flame, OK? Uh, the kinetics expert, they put a lot of reactions, but they never compute a flame. They give you a chemical scheme which was validated for auto-ignition over a range of temperature and uh, equivalence ratio. And then, if you want to compute a flame, you need much more than that. You need the chemical kinetics that those people give you, and you need the molecular transport models for molecular transport, diffusion, diffusivity, whatever. And then you need to describe the flow also, uh, depending on what you do. The first flame that you can do is the 1D flame. The one-dimensional laminar premix flame, which Moshe will describe tomorrow. So it's a flame in a tube, which is planar, and it's moving from left, <clears throat> from right to left. It's eating the cold gases. Here you get kinetics and thermochemistry, and you add transport. You need to describe the diffusion of heat, the lambda, that Moshe described this morning, and you need the description of the diffusivity of the species, D. This comes from the kinetic theory of gases, something that the kinetics expert never look at. Why? Because if you take a full scheme, 10,000 reactions, 
and you try to do that, you can't. It's not going to work. It's crazy. And no one tries to do it. I mean, it's just too complicated. So there is a problem that always is the same in our community, is that the full scheme, the big, big schemes, cannot be used as soon as you try to do something where you have a real flame. You need to simplify them somehow. Otherwise, it's just too, too big, too complicated. And if you need to do now a 2D flame, like the Benson burner, you need to describe now the fluid mechanics also. Okay, because you need to compute the velocity profile everywhere, so you need now to add something about fluid mechanics, boundary conditions, etc. So this gets a little bit more complicated, I would say. But then, uh, this is laminar. If you want to do a turbulent flame, you're going to take the same flow here, and you in inject turbulence. <clears throat> and so the flow will become turbulent, and then uh, you will have to care about turbulence. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a few days, but that means the resolution that you will need will be even higher than it was for laminar flames. As soon as you do that, if you look at the problems in industry, you will realize that the only place where people will look at that is tortures. And for tortures, uh, what's very important for tortures is uh, it, those are diffusion flames, so they make soot, so you need to predict soot. To predict soot, you need to predict temperature. And then you will start to worry about radiation models. And so right away, now the complexity will suddenly increase a lot because the radiation code to predict radiation is often more complicated than the combustion code. Then after that, you forget about confined. You go to, you, about unconfined. You go to confined cases. As soon as you go to confined cases, basically you have to take another code. Okay? You need the code where you can do unstructured meshes and boundary conditions and walls and heat transfer. So this is where you go into this type of simulations where now you have walls everywhere and you need to compute the waves. So you need to take into account acoustics. That's an additional complexity. I will talk about that in a few days to show you that you can do it with CFD code, but that's a complicated game. And then you need to care about heat transfer. This is a view of, a, of an helicopter chamber. If you have good eyes, the first thing you will see is that these walls are full of holes. Okay? There are holes everywhere. They are multi-perforated to cool them. So if you want to compute realistically a flame like this, you need to compute the flow in all the holes and the coupling between the cooling of the walls and the flame itself. So by the way, you need to care about heat transfer, and heat transfer in itself is complicated. Again, we talk about complexity. That's very really complex. Now, the walls themselves can move. If you look at the solid rocket propulsion system here, you get walls protruding into the flow, and these walls are actually moving and coupling themselves with the acoustics here. So you may have to do fluid structure interaction. That's even more complicated. And uh, you have to remember that when you start assembling all these things together, you are very far from the problem of kinetics expert, which they tell you you need 10,000 reactions. Here you have to take into account all these things, and you have to be careful that you work on the weakest link in your model. And the weakest link may not be the one that you would like to work on. Okay? The weakest link is often at another place. And then you talk to the people doing numerical methods, and they start laughing, and they say, oh, no, no, you don't look at the right problem. Because your problem is that uh, you don't have the right type of mesh, so your solution is corrupted by errors, or you don't have a high order scheme. You are working second order, you should work third or fourth order, or you should use an, another method. And uh, then uh, your time integration is not good, you need to work on the boundary conditions. You need to go to HPC. We'll talk about HPC again uh, this week, you know, HP, high performance computing. It, you know, 20 years ago, any one of you could take, you know, uh, a, a small computer and write a code, okay, and run it. That's over. Today, if you don't have a high-performance code, you are not going to be able to produce a, a, a paper which can be published. You, know, you will have a resolution of two million points where we do two billions. So it's just no chance, okay? When I say two billions, it's more like 20 billion points today. If you want to do a 20 billion point simulation, you need 100,000 processes. And if you want to run a code on 100,000 processes, you cannot do it alone, okay? And you need people who are not even CFD people. You need computer science people, message passing experts, uh, data management, GPU, whatever. We'll talk about that later. So that's, that's, that's probably the most important part here. Uh, if you want to be competitive today, you need a high performance code, and that's quite tough. The other problem is that if you have a HPC code, it's difficult to maintain, difficult to adjust to the new compilers, and uh, 
it gets difficult to. And then, of course, if you do coupling with radiation or heat transfer, you will need a multi-physics uh, formulation here. And as I said, at the end of the day, you don't want to do that for one case. You want to do it uh, uh, for many cases doing optimization. You want to quantify the errors on your result, and you want to do also data assimilation. That means if I give you results of experiments, you should be able to modify your code so that you match the experiments better. You can improve your model. So you see that when you talk about complexity, depending on your PhD, you're going to be working on some of those things. Maybe not all of them, probably not, huh? but you will have to pick up where you want to work. So here, I've put here one sentence, which was the first sentence of a code called Kiva. I don't know if, if people know. Kiva is still used today. Kiva was the first code uh, on combustion written by Sandia, I don't know, in 78 or 80 or something. It was written by a guy called Peter O'Rourke. He was a nice guy. And the first thing he put on the first line was, don't be a perfectionist. If you try to do everything well, don't do combustion. Okay? Do structures or do mass. But if you want to do everything well, give up. Don't try. It's just too complicated. And the important thing also is that it really means that you should not, in your PhD, focus on something because you know it. You should focus on the weakest link of the whole chain, which contains many of these ing ingredients which I've shown you. And the classical example is, for example, this one. You know, if you're an expert in kinetics and you do a lot of work on your kinetical scheme, and then you have a very lousy heat transfer model to the walls, well, the result will be bad, okay? Because everything is sensitive to temperature, so if you do badly here, the overall result will be bad. So it's difficult to know, but in practice, you have to be sure that you concentrate on the right problem. And it's not always clear where the bad part of your model is. But don't, you know, that's what we say in French, probably the same in English, don't look for your keys in the only room where there is light, okay? Maybe it's in the room where there is no light. You have to, you have to go there. So just to finish for the, before we take a break here, uh, I, I, want to show, I don't want to show this movie to Alison because she would get crazy, but that, that's the view on, on chemistry of one of my students who is now at SpaceX. And uh, uh, it's a movie for kids up to eight years old, I guess. So we'll see if you, if, if, if you get it right. What is a flame? Bob, Bob, come here. Bob, stop. Bob, stop. Stop, Bob. Hey, sorry about that. Hi, everyone. I'm Professor Benzin, and today we will discover what a flame is. So let's go to my lab and have a look at a real flame. Very soon, you will understand the two most important things about flames. First, why it's hot, which is very convenient for French cuisine, and also why it creates light, which is very convenient at night. Let's see, to have a flame we need three things. First, the fuel, which contains energy and which can be paper or wood. Then the oxygen, which is part of the air. And something very hot, like this nail or uh, the sparks of this lighter, for example. If even one of these components is missing, the flame cannot survive. In the following experiment, when the flame has used all the oxygen trapped in this glass, it dies. Okay, these were the basic things about flames. But to really understand what a flame is, we need to dive into it. Most things are made of tiny building blocks called molecules. Close to a flame, we have two kinds of molecules. The molecules of the fuel on one side and the molecules of oxygen from the air on the other side. To burn, the first half to mix. At low temperature, molecules move quite slowly, and when they collide, basically nothing happens. At high temperature, it's completely different. The molecules move much faster because they are excited by the heat, shown in red here. And there are some damages when they collide. These dramatic collisions are called chemical reactions. Once the fuel and the oxygen have broken apart, the smaller components join together to give new molecules like water or carbon dioxide. At the same time, as new molecules are formed, the energy of the fuel is turned into heat. Part of this heat is transferred to other molecules and triggers millions of chemical reactions. And that's why flames are so hot. 
If we now have a closer loop at a flame, we see that it creates light, but also that there are different colors in the flame. The blue comes from tiny molecules that appear for a short time during chemical reactions. Bigger molecules are also formed and can join together to give soot. When it's cold, soot is black. But in the flame it's very hot and soot glows as the coals in a barbecue. That's why flames are so bright. We now understand better what a flame is. So let's use what we just learned to explain how a flame works for a candle. Did you know, for example, that the fuel is the wax and not the string? So let's start with the first experiment. If you stand a couple of feet away and point a flashlight at a candle, you will be able to see its shadow. We call it a shadow graph. With this technique, we are able to see the hot stream of gas that comes from the flame. Come on, Bob, I'm working. What we don't see with the shadow graph is that some of the heat goes back to the candle and is used to melt the wax. And you can use some black powder to see its motion. The melted wax is then absorbed by the string, as would be some water by a sponge or this piece of sugar. At the top of the string it's very hot because the flame is closed and the liquid wax turns into gaseous wax, just like this water in this very exciting experiment. The wax molecules are now free to mix with the oxygen and burn in the flame. There is a cool experiment that shows that the wax is gaseous when it burns. After you blow off a candle, the white smoke you see is actually gaseous wax and can be ignited. And you can see the blue flame traveling back to the string. Wow, 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 we have learned so many things. So Bob, can you tell me now what a flame is? Yeah, it's a piece of cake. A flame is a region of a gas mixture where heat and light are produced by chemical reactions. Yes, good job! And don't forget, only do these experiments with your dragon, uh, your parents. I don't tell Ed that I showed this picture, okay? It's just uh, for kinetics. It's, uh, the, actually, you know, it's a strange movie because it looks simple, but if, would, if you would need to compute a candle, uh, it's really tough. Okay, it's the kind of flow which is complicated to, to simulate. Okay, so we'll, we'll take a break and then after that we'll start the equations. Any question at that point or comment? Yes? So, in MES, when we do this complex flow, like you showed the first slide where it was fully simulated gas turbines, are we using some kind of wall models and is it possible with combustion to use a wall model? Yeah, for most cases we use low of the wall. Uh, because if the Reynolds is high enough, we cannot do wall resolve simulation, so we need to use low of the walls near the walls. Because the Y plus is too big, we cannot resolve the turbulence near the wall, the Reynolds number is just too large. But then because of combustion pressure dilation, wouldn't uh, the walls block? I don't know that, but... They are, the yeah, in the, in, the, in the book I mentioned, we describe low of the walls with combustion, but indeed it's a weak point of LES. The weakest point of LES has always been the walls. It's the same for an aircraft, actually. Far from the wings, you're good, but at the walls, you are not good with LES. It's the weakest part of LES is how do you handle the walls. So are there wall models specifically made for combustion? Yeah, there are special wall models for combustion because of dilatation effects yeah. and density ratios. So it, you need to do special models for low of the walls with combustion. Absolutely. Other question before coffee? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, normally, normally in an engine, uh, you have the mean pressure, and if the excursions on both sides in the experiment are too large, you say this engine cannot be operated. None of you has an unstable engine in his car because it would be crazy to drive. So we eliminate those engines right away. But uh, there are engines which have this uh, cycle to cycle variations, and LES captures that. And the whole game is to know how to eliminate them. For example, you can move the spark and uh, get rid of the corrosion stabilities when you know why they would occur. 
so you, 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 you can compute, it's possible to compute and to reproduce what you find in engine. It's just quite expensive. Well, I didn't, I, I went fast on quantification of errors, okay? The problem of quantification is that if anyone in this room does a very heavy, expensive computation, the first question of the engineers will be, is it precise? It's sure expensive, but is it precise? What's the range of confidence that I can have? And that's very difficult to, to say. And it's a field in itself. It's a quantification of uncertainties on the solution today is another unsolved problem uh, in CFD. But we can use a neural network. You can use a lot of things, but uh, there are many things which are, th there are errors on the model. For example, if you use the law of the wall, what is the error introduced by the law of the wall? No one knows. What is the error introduced by the mesh? No one knows, What's the intro et cetera, et cetera. There, and the people specialize in the quantification of uncertainties, they have a whole pattern to do that. But the problem is that it's too complicated to, to apply. When you do a high PC, a HPC simulation of combustion, you are just at the limit already of what you can do. You cannot afford to do other things, just the maximum you can afford. And so the, the, the point is that today, I don't think a, P, a reasonable PhD student would bet his life that his computation is right. He would say, it's the best I can do. <laughs> and, and I think that would be safe. <laughs> No, it's, it's, again, it's a complicated problem, and we don't want to, no, we should not be ashamed that we are facing a complicated problem and that we are not sure that we're solving it completely. It's just the way it is. And if you, if you say otherwise, you are just lying. That's the point. That's the problem is this field. If you're selling a commercial code, you spend your time saying it's right. No, buy it. Just pay my license. And that's it's not safe. <laughs> I wouldn't bet. I think the user is more, impo more important than the software. Okay? Uh, so you can use, uh, I, I've seen very good computation with Fluent, for example. If you know what you do, I think it's, uh, it's, it's quite possible. Yeah. Even in Fluent, they're using, I will describe that in two days, they, describe, they use explicit high order schemes, let's say higher order, and uh, you can have a good solution with Fluent, absolutely. Yeah. You, have to, you have to know what you do. And, okay, the other limit is uh, if you want to do a computation with Fluent on 2 billion points with 100,000 processors, then you're in trouble. First, it doesn't scale, then you pay by processor. <laughs> uh, many, of, many of my students have been doing computation which requires 30 million hours, CPU, 30 million hours, it's 3 cents per hour, so it's 1 million euro. So it's, uh, if you do that with Fluent, you, just, you cannot afford it. But again, you don't need to do that. Okay? There are many cases which you can do with Fluent. Uh, you don't have to do two extreme cases. Okay, we go for coffee. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are going to we are going to finish for today. I think you're probably going to be saturated soon, so uh, want to relax. Remember, it's only the first day, okay? You have to last five days. Uh, okay, so I've finished uh, what I call usually the introduction, uh, and uh, the introduction is designed in this course so to keep you happy, okay? Before I start what I'm going to do now, <laughs> which is to go into the real business, okay? Uh, the real business is look at the equations. So to do that, uh, I need to go back to a few combustion basics. Um, and uh, mainly, most of these things will be the conservation equations that you've seen this morning, but I will start after what Moshe has done, and then I will apply them to laminar flames so that uh, when we go to turbulent cases, uh, you know where you are. Just a message here. I'm quite worried. Uh, as an editor of Combustion Flame, you know, I see, I find 200 people specialized of CFD for one theoretician. Uh, everyone wants to do CFD. It's a bad idea. I mean, it's, it was nice 10 years ago, but everyone's doing CFD today. So please do experiments or do uh, COE or do 
experiments and simulation, or theory and simulation, but just running a code today, uh, we need a technician to do that. Okay? We don't need a PhD. Okay? Just running a code just doesn't bring much. So uh, go back to, uh, go back to, to theory. Uh, remember also that usually the main problem you know, in CFD is just uh, between the screen and the chair. And, uh, and uh, usually the problem is that this guy didn't read enough of the theory. He's trying to compute something, doesn't know that it has an analytical solution. Or, so um, just come back to theory. As you see, that's quite useful. For example, flame stretch, something that we described today. Flame stretch, most of you know what flame stretch is, but you don't realize how flame stretch is obtained. Moshe will remind you of that, but flame stretch is purely a theoretical notion, okay? Obtained for 1D flame with single step chemistry and all that. And it's not coming from any other place. It's theoretical. If you don't understand how it come, where it comes from, it's going to be difficult to, 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 to do a simulation. So what we need to discuss here are first the conservation equations. I want, here um, we're going to do a small quiz so to see how good you are here. And this is described in chapter one in the book. Then we'll talk about premix flame, diffusion flame, not today. Huh? We'll stop somewhere here. And then we'll talk about other flames. Not every flame, the classification premixed and diffusion is not complete. There are flames which are not premixed and not diffusion. They are just in the middle. So I've said that I was really interested in turbulent combustion. So why do I need to talk about laminar combustion? Well, because many things don't change between laminar and turbulent flames. For example, the first thing is that if this is a black box in which I inject some fuel and some oxidizer and I burn it, whether I burn it in a laminar way or in a turbulent way, what comes out is the same. Okay, so the adiabatic flame temperature should be the same, of course, in a laminar flow and in a turbulent flow. So you must know how to compute it, and Moshe has shown you how to do that this morning. But it's not the only reason. Uh, the other reason is that a lot of models for turbulent flames are based on flamelet IDs. What is the flamelet ID is the fact that if you look at a turbulent flame, uh, like this one here, every piece here of this flame is actually like a small laminar flame <clears throat> submitted to the same conditions. We have to define what we call conditions. And so, and, but it is locally like a laminar flame. So for example, the speed of this flame is the same as a laminar flame. And so that will help us a lot when we build models. So this is why before you talk about a turbulent flame, you have to be able to understand what the structure of a laminar flame would be in the same conditions. This idea of flamelet model might be misleading. Uh, not every flame is a flamelet. And uh, I want to take here uh, one issue, which is the issue of the Lewis number. So we'll, you will hear a lot about Lewis number who doesn't know here what the Lewis number is, by the way? Everyone knows. You know, it's the ratio of heat diffusivity to specious diffusivity. This is the, the best topic of Moshe. He will talk about that a lot. Uh, I just want to remind you here that this number controls a lot of things in combustion. Okay? Whether this number is more or less than unity, it says how fast your species are diffusing. The H2 atoms have a Lewis number of 0.3 which means that uh, the heat is diffusing you know, 0.3 times more slowly than the H2. And that plays a big role on the structure of flames. Now, in interestingly, uh, in a laminar flame, we know that the species are transported by this molecular process. So if there is a lot of hydrogen here, it will diffuse three times faster than heat and move to another place. In a laminar flow, there is no mean velocity. But if it is a turbulent flow, the H2 will be carried by vortices. And then when a vortex carries H2, it carries all the other molecules in the same way. So you will say that uh, in your code, if you do laminar combustion, it will take a Lewis number of 0.3. But if you do a turbulent flame, you would like to take a Lewis number of unity because there is no difference between any molecule when they are carried away. And uh, if you look at the literature, you will see that people actually do both because we don't really know if saying that the flame fronts are laminar makes sense in a turbulent combustion model. And uh, so you will see people using Lewis equal unity and people using Lewis equal 0.3. And of course, it's not the same result. Huh? So this is, uh, before we go into turbulent cases, let's stick for the moment to uh, the premix flames and uh, let's stick actually to the conservation equations. 
So uh, a little bit of uh, simple things, OK? Many of you have done classical CFD. Classical CFD, normally you use air. Remember the rules? Normally you have one mole of O2 in this room for 3.76 moles of N2. So the average <coughs> molecular weight of air is the molecular weight of O2 plus 3.76 WN2 divided by 4.76. Okay, it's, that's, it's a mean obtained by the molar fractions, and that's about 29 grams per mole. By the way, I always say to my students, never use grams, use kilograms, because there are places where it makes a difference, like when you compute the R constant in the perfect gas equation. If you use 29 instead of 0 0.029, it will make a big difference. Um, remember also that these gases, air, you get O2 and N2, both of them are at low temperature, perfect gases, so we know they are CV and they are CP, 2.5R, 3.5R with R equal 8.32, so that's quite convenient. So when you compute the flow around an aircraft, you always use the same values for the molecular uh, C, uh, heat capacities. Now, uh, and the gamma is 1.4, okay? When you do aerodynamics around an aircraft, that's easy. And so when you need now mass capacities, you divide the, molecule, the molar capacities by the molecular weight, and you obtain the famous 1004 that probably some of you have seen in, in all these codes for aerodynamics. So, that's air. Many of you have used it. The problem is that air composition is constant, so the only thing which could happen is a change of CP because of temperature, but in most cases we do I was, you know, isothermal flows, so it's quite easy. In the flame, we have to change all that. So, in a flame, we will uh, use two types of ways to define the composition. Composition is the first thing in the flame. Either we use molar fractions, the number of moles of K divided by the total number of moles, or we use mass fraction, the mass of K divided by the total mass. Unfortunately, we could have you know, thought that uh, we would agree on which one to use. It's not the case. If you use Cortera or many ZWD models, they use molar fractions. Uh, most of the big 3D codes use only mass fractions, and you have to go from one to the other. You need to know how to do that. I will show that in a second. They have exactly the same information, okay? Because you can go from one to the other. The mass fraction is just the mass of the K species, so it's the molecular weight of K multiplied by the number of moles of K divided by the average W multiplied by the number of moles so you see it's WK over W multiplied by XK. So you can go from XK to YK, huh? no problem. And uh, we will stick to also what Moshe said, that means we'll take a mixture of perfect gases. So we'll say that the pressure is the sum of the partial pressure of all the gases, and each gas, each species has, is a perfect gas with its own WK here. This is where you want to put kilograms and not grams. And the average value is P equal to RT over W, where W is the mean mass fraction, the mean molecular weight. Okay, so that's, that's uh, uh, easy. How do you obtain W? I've shown you before. If you know the XK, you just take this relation. And this is the place where you want to be careful. W equals sum the WK XK, but W is not equal to the sum the WK YK. Okay, it's only for, ma for more, more of fraction. If you want to use the YK, because your code has only the YKs, um, you just write this, you know, sum of the xk equal to 1, and you replace xk by this expression, and you see that from that you get 1 over w equals sum of the yk wk. It's simple, but I, uh, I've seen a lot of people getting confused about that. But just, just a small detail. Now, are there cases where this uh, perfect gas equation doesn't work? Yes. Diesel, rocket combustion. Every time uh, pressure gets to more than 60, 80 bars. The perfect gas equation doesn't work. You cannot write P equal to RT. You need to write P equal to RT plus T3 to the power, blah, blah, blah. You need an extended perfect gas equation. In all other cases, it works. But if you do diesel engines, or let's say high pressure systems, you have to go to something more sophisticated. Apart from that, it's a very good model. So this is just what you will use in your code, either you will work with XK or with uh, YK, and this is the way to obtain the mean molar weight as a function of XK or YK. Uh, just remember that uh, compared to classical aerodynamics, it really means that uh, W will change a lot, 
And uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, uh, something which is important, for example, for an H2O2 flame. Uh, here, the molecular weight will be 2 grams. Here, it will be 32 for O2 and 18 in the water. So really, you cannot say that the molecular weight is constant. So you cannot say that the, the perfect gas constant is a constant. Okay? The P equal to RT, the R changes a lot, changes by a factor of 16. So if you write a code, don't start by saying that R is a constant. So stoichiometry I've already defined, so no need to go back to that. Uh, just a small homework if you are not tied to that tonight. Uh, compute the fuel mass fraction in a mixture where you have air and you know that phi is imposed. So typically, I have a stoichiometric mixture of CH4 and air. What is the concentration of CH4? Easy job for you if you do combustion. Uh, the formula is written here. You can just rederive it. The reason I'm showing that is also to help Moshe. Uh, if you compute the fuel mass fraction in all these mixtures here, you see that it's always very low. Okay, for methane, propane, uh, uh, H2, you go to you know, point oh something, which really means that the mixture of fuel and air in normal equivalence ratio, let's say one one, is really air. Okay, there's like you see here in a methane air mixture, you get five percent of methane. All the rest is air. So if you want to write a model for the thermal diffusivity or for the CP, you can say, I don't care about CH4. I take only air. And that's what Moshe will do, and I will do it too, when I will do theoretical derivations. I will say, it's air. Don't forget, forget about the rest. So when you will need viscosity, density, conductivity, I will take the viscosity, conductivity of air. I don't care about the, the, the fuel, which makes my life a little bit simpler. So we need to discuss CFD now. Uh, and the first thing is, uh, uh, how complicated will this business be compared to classical aerodynamics? So let's start with classical aerodynamics. So let me ask you a question. So you are using Fluent in 3D to compute the flow around an aircraft. How many unknowns do you have at every point? Who knows that? You know, you, you, I'm sure many of you have run fluent. So uh, did you ever wonder how many unknowns? You have n points, OK? So at each point, what are the unknown quantities? There are three, I can tell you, the velocities, OK? U, V, W, that's, that's easy. How many additional quantities do you need? Two more, exactly, so five. And these two can be a combination of anything between density and temperature, or density or pressure, or pressure and entropy, entropy and temperature. All these are state equations, but only two of them are independent. So usually people use density, because we have the mass conservation equation, and one energy, or enthalpy. That's five. <clears throat> so we have five unknowns, so we need five equations. OK? Yeah. That's simple. Three for momentum, for the three velocities. For Rho, we need the mass conservation. And for energy, we need the energy equation. Okay. Pressure will be obtained from, if I have Rho and energy, I can have Rho and T. And from that, I will have P equal Rho RT. I will have pressure from the state equation. We always have the state equation. Okay? State equation is the data. In the problem. There's only two, again, the, the important statement here is that there are only two thermodynamic independent variables among all of them. And there are, you will see in a minute, there are many you can take, but you only need two independent. Now, if you go to combustion, instead of five, we have five plus the composition. Composition is Y case. How many Y case do we have? Depends on the scheme. If you have N species, you need N unknowns, N Y K values. If you know right away that the sum of the Y K is equal to unity, you can say I need only N minus one. Okay, because the last one will be one minus the others, the sum of the others. But still, n can be large. Okay? Remember that uh, if you listen to Alison, well, you don't because you're here, but Alison will show schemes where n is equal to 500. Uh, 500? Yeah. Are you joking? I mean, you, start, you have a code with five unknowns, you go to 505, it's not the same thing. Okay? So we want to keep n small. What is small? Today, you will see that we have ends between 10, 20, 30, 50, maybe. 
uh, almost no one does n more than 100 in a 3D code because it gets crazy. It's too big. Every time you add one species, you add one conservation equation. Okay, it's a it's a big job. So we'll need five plus n minus one equations. Okay, as many equations as variables. So which one are we going to use? The momentum equation, one equation for energy or enthalpy or entropy or temperature or whatever, and one equation for continuity. But now we have an equation for continuity of each species the mass of each species, the equation that Moshe has shown this morning. So we need to write this equation and to think about them. Uh, the equation for momentum is good because it's the same with and without flame. Actually, the momentum doesn't really know about uh, uh, you know, species. It's just a mixture of them, except if you add forces like we did with electron and ions, but here I didn't put them. So this is what uh, Moshe has shown this morning. You have the pressure term and the viscous stress, and the viscous stress is usually written like this where well, this is the, the compressible part. Now, the density here is changing compared to air because uh, you know the temperature is changing and you know that when the temperature is increasing, the viscosity is up or down? Increasing, almost like temperature. So that the kinematic viscosity nu is actually increasing like T squared, okay? Because it's mu over rho and rho goes down, so mu goes up, rho goes down, so nu changes like t squared, which is a funny thing because no one expecting that, but uh, if you're looking at the candle, the viscosity of the burned gases is like 50 times more than the viscosity of the fresh gases. And uh, normally people don't, need to, don't guess that because the temperature is like seven times higher, so seven to the square is 49. So the viscosity of the burn gases in the candle is like 50 times more than in the fresh. Now, because they are light, they go up, you have always have the feeling that they are you know, moving you know, easily, but no, they are actually quite viscous compared to the fresh gases. But apart from that, if you have a code which can solve this equation, you can use the same for uh, a flame. The total mass, easy, okay? Uh, combustion does not create total mass, does not destroy, destroy total mass, so we're good. Now, the specious equation we have written this morning by Moshe. Uh, just a small thing that he did not show, so I'm, I'm, I'm completing his course. Uh, there's a joke here about uh, the fact that uh, <clears throat> this is the conservation equation of one species, so if we sum all of them, we must find the conservation equation of the global mixture. But this is not obvious because the sum of the chemical reaction is zero. That's clear because uh, it's just, uh, you know, if you write, H2 plus one half O2 gives H2. This is conserving mass. So the sum of the omega dot K is built to give zero. But the sum of the VK, I, Y, K, no. And so you must have a model so that the sum of the VK, I, Y, K here sums to zero in this equation. And when you write your own model, it is not always guaranteed. And so uh, this equation here, if you are not careful when you write your model, you are going to create mass or lose mass. Um, how do you obtain the VK, the diffusion velocities? The diffusion velocities are given by this equation. I think I took here the version of, uh, of uh, Foreman Williams, but uh, uh, the, the reference book for that is Ern and Jovogili. Quite tough to read, but it's completely uh, exhaustive. And uh, if you look at this expression, it's an implicit expression for the VK. Okay? And you can show that the best expansion to this equation when there, was, there are no forces here, so there is the, there's no electric field or anything, so you just keep the first term, the best solution is this one, Hirschfelder's law. Now, I would just want to raise your attention. Moshe is a theoretician, so he doesn't want to care about the details. He's using fixed law. Fixed law is not as good as Hirschfelder's law. What's the difference? This is the gradient of the y xk here. This is the gradient of the y case here. Not the same. Moshe assumed W to be constant, so he wouldn't have a problem with that. But Jovo uh, uh, and Ern have shown that this is a better expression than this one. So we use normally in most codes, people would use Hirschfelder's law, okay? As a function of the gradient of the K. Th these two things are not equal, okay? There's a W between the two which makes things complicated. So use that. Hirschfelder's law is the best solution. No, they're not, because YK, look at that. Um, if you look at the definition of YK here, YK 
is equal to, uh, to xk multiplied by wk, which is a constant, but w is not constant. So the gradient of xk would involve a gradient of wyk plus w grad yk, and it's not constant. So it, it, I, I saw the same thing initially. Said, but why do we bother? With, but no, you have to you have to see that it's not the same. This is multi-component diffusion, okay? Okay, this is, this is something I explained in the book. It took me a long time to understand that. Uh, the, if you have uh, only two species, fixed law is exact, okay? If you have only two. Uh, but if you have more than two, then Hirschfelder is better than fixed. And if you have two, actually, the two are equivalent. This is the only case where they're equivalent because there's only two species. But again, the reference here is Ern and Jovogigli, but again, it's, it's a tough piece to read. Uh, but this is, not, this is not the only trick here. Uh, <clears throat> how do you obtain all that? Uh, the diffusion coefficients which are here, the decays here, this is the diffusion coefficient of species K in the mixture. This you don't have initially. What you have from kinetic theory is the binary coefficient, dgk of j into k or k into g, they are equal. And you need to construct the dk by this expression here. Again, that comes from uh, kinetic theory, and most codes do that. And they use this expression here. And again, everything then will depend on how you compute this guy. In many codes, people don't even bother to do that. They right away compute the heat diffusivity and they divide it by the Lewis number and they get the decays. They don't even use this formula, which is okay until you compute H2O2 flames, you know, but if you have a premix flame with a lot of nitrogen, uh, this is quite precise. Taking dk equal 0.3 for H2 will take you where you want to go. If you want to be more precise, this looks small, but this is big. If you want to compute dk by this formula, you need the dgk, then you need the collision integrals. And believe me, <laughs> it, it, it takes a while. Uh, so why do we do that? It's because the Lewis numbers are actually very, pretty good when you say they are constant. This is the Lewis number of many species in a premix flame. So temperature goes from 300 to 2000. And you have here the Lewis number of H2, of OH, of H2, CH4, etc. And you see they are constant. So it's really not a problem to say that the diffusion coefficients, that the Lewis number is constant. The diffusion coefficients change because the diffusivity increases here, but the Lewis number is really pretty close to constant. So it's a pretty good approximation to say that Lewis number is constant in a premix flame and to use that in your code. Now there's an additional trick which I mentioned before. If you use this conservation equation in your code and you sum all of them, you see that here, if you use Hirschfelder's law, you don't obtain zero. You obtain this funny expression here. Why is it so? Well, because, you know, some of the xk is constant, but some of the dk, wk, xk is not constant, uh, so it's, the derivative will not be zero. So you have a term here. And if you're not careful, depending on how you code that, you will not conserve mass. That means you will write this equation for your species, and when your PhD advisor will ask you to look at the sum of the xk or some of the yk, it will not be constant. Mass will not be conserved which is a small problem. I guess you all agree that it would be good to conserve mass. So what do we do? We use what we call the correction velocity. Instead of coding Hirschfelder and Curtis here, we use the same thing plus a VC here, which is a constant correction velocity. And how do we choose VC? We choose it such that when we sum everything, we obtain this, and we choose this thing equal to that one. So we choose VC equal this expression so that when we sum all the conservation equation, we obtain indeed the uh, conservation of uh, mass. It looks like a detail, but again, when you use a code, you should check that this is right, that the VK actually written like this. Okay, this is VC here. So be careful. If you use you know, a well-established code, no, it should be okay, but if you use open form written by some PhD in some way or other, just go ahead and check that you conserve mass, and it's not always guaranteed. Okay, last equation, energy. That's, uh, that's the, the place where there are so many. Uh, normally, you can take the one you want. Okay, if you don't do a mistake, it's all equivalent. In practice, it's easy to, to get it wrong. And especially, you should be aware of taking the code of someone else 
and just using his equation, saying, oh, it should be the right equation. Um, one way to get confused is that you get codes which use low Mach number or incompressible or compressible formulations, and that leads to the elimination of certain terms in the equation. You might want to be careful about that. The other thing is what you call energy. So I've put a summary of all this equation in, in the book. I just want to, to, to summarize how we do that. First thing you have to remember is that, uh, again, we did not arrive at a point in the commercial community where we would agree that we would work with molar or with mass quantities. So you have some people working with the molar enthalpy of specious K or with the mass enthalpy of specious K. You go from one to the other easily, okay? The mass is just the molar divided by the molecular weight. But when you write your code, you know, it's one or the other. Uh, most 0D and 1D flames work with this code and most 3D codes work with mass quantities. Uh, um, remember that uh, for many of, well, I have here an assistance of people who do combustion, but when you talk to CFD people, when you ask them what enthalpy is, they tell you CPT. Now, enthalpy is not CPT, it's only CPT when CP is constant. But for us, we know that CP is not constant. CP is changing, and the right definition is integral of the reference temperature T0, which can be 0 or 298.15 to the temperature T of CPK dt, which would be CPT if CP would be constant, plus the formation enthalpy. Okay? And this is the full, this is what we call the, the real enthalpy, the mass enthalpy of specious K. And uh, again, these things are tabulated for you. This comes from a table that you input in your code, and it's everywhere, and CPK is the same. CPK, you have two big families in this world, people who write CPK as a polynomial formula, uh, fourth order, usually, which forces you to do every iteration, every point of computation of t to the power 4, to the power 3. And we, we actually tab tabulate them as a function of linear uh, shape every 100k, which is faster for, again, HPC reasons. Okay, if you do a code where you do millions of iterations on billions of points, it's kind of stupid to compute a polynomial. I mean, you should, you should use another thing. And for the mixture, the total enthalpy of the mixture is the sum of the HK, YK. Okay. And this is the quantity which would be written in your code, one, one of the possibility of that. Again, uh, just here to remind you that uh, this is the mass formation, this is the molar formation, this is tabulated, you just put it in your code with the right uh, molecular weight, and that, that's for most cases it will cover what you need to do. Now, heat capacities, CPK, okay, CPK, if, the, if you are in the perfect world, uh, the molar value, 3.5R, 2.5R, 1.4, this is air. And so for aerodynamics, we get this classical formula, but for flames, it's not working this way, because not all gases are uh, diatomic. You get H2O, CO2, and also the most important thing is that this limit here works only for cold gases. So when you go to high temperature, CPK goes up, okay? And uh, so you need to account for that. So again, depending on how you do that, you, you need a tabulation. You need to account for the fact that the CPs are changing. When we do theory, we don't care. Moshe tomorrow will tell you CP equal constant because it doesn't change too much. But if you want to be quantitative, then you need to account for the changes in CPK. Uh, two reasons. Not all gases are diatomic, and when they are, CP still goes up with temperature. The limit of the kinetic theory of gases is for low temperatures, so it works extremely well, but we are not at low temperatures. 2500K is not low. Now, this was for the molar values. If you go to the mass heat capacities, this is what you obtain. The famous 1004 here. And then you have the CPK of H2O, CO2, etc., N2. And this is, again, this has to be tabulated in your code. If you're using open form or fluent, this is done. Huh? You don't have to worry about it. Now, do you really need to account for it? If you do a 1D flame, where, like with Kemkin, Cortera, Cosilab, they all uh, do that, okay? And fluent does it too. Uh, and uh, because it would change temperatures, you know, by a few hundred K. Um, but when we do theory, like Moshe will do tomorrow, we don't. We say CP equal constant. What does it change? Well, it makes our life much easier when CP equal constant. You will see that tomorrow. Uh, but what happens when we do that? Well, 
The adiabatic flame temperatures usually we will be wrong by 200K or 300K or something. We can always tune things a little bit. Uh, so it's not too bad for temperatures, but where it's bad, it's for pollutants. Okay. If you want to predict NO, you cannot be wrong by 200K. NO, usually, you know, we keep saying the order of magnitude is that if you are wrong by 25K on NO, it's 100% on the level of NOx which, which are produced. So 25K, 100%, 200K, you will predict nothing. So if you want to do COE, you say CP equal constant and you're good. But if you want to predict pollutants, you need to account for variable CPs. Otherwise, you, you'd be too far away uh, from the problem. Note that the physics remains the same. If you want to look at uh, the response to stretch at heat losses, at ignition, etc., assuming that CP is constant is not a big deal, um, especially if it helps you do theory. If you want to know uh, uh, what the values are, you can go on the website here. You, know, you, you just enter uh, the fuel that you have, the pressure and temperature, you will get the adiabatic flame temperature using Cantera. So, uh, as I said, we have all equations, but for the moment, I didn't tell you which equation we should use for energy. Uh, I will talk about energy, but we can talk about enthalpy, entropy, pressure. Any combination of two of these variables will, will do the job. Remember that uh, for non-reacting flows, we had enthalpy and total enthalpy. That's all. CPT plus one half u square. Everyone doing flows around an aircraft is doing that. But for us, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, we have the sensible enthalpy, which contains only that term. Then we can add the formation enthalpy. Then we can add on these two the kinetic energy. And then we can have the total enthalpy, which is the sum of all that. Depending on who you are, you, are, you might prefer one equation or another. Um, and uh, it doesn't really matter. You can take any one in your code. But of course, you have to be sure which one you are using. And you know, many people tell you, I'm using total energy. Well, which total energy? There are, there are many total energies in this table. Okay? You might want to make sure which one you are using. One thing that uh, Moshe wanted to avoid this morning, he told you that the heat flux was that, minus lambda grad T. Okay? It's not true, actually. You need, you need an additional term here due to the diffusion velocities of species. If, if species diffuse, then the heat diffuses too, and you have to account for it. If you have a velocity induced here by a gradient, then it leads also to a gradient in the flux. So it's not only Fourier you have to add this second term. It's no big deal, but again, if you forget it in your code, uh, you, you're going to be wrong. And that's the final equations. In these equations, you can forget uh, this is the volume source terms and these are the force source terms. You can remove them. But depending which equation you are solving, well, you should make sure that uh, this is the equations that you are solving. And again, if you have a well-established code, no problem. If, you have, if you're writing your own code or if you took the code of your neighbor, you should check. My experience is that usually it's wrong. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's complicated, okay? It's a, it's, a, it's a complicated business. So this, this thing's volume source will go away. So if you remove for volume force and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and source terms, you are left with this equation. Here you have a reaction rate, omega dot T. This is the heat released by combustion. Note that there are in your code, there are N reaction rates for each species, omega dot k, but there's only one heat release term, which is this guy, OK? Now, the, the, this expression here gets a little bit more complicated if you work with temperature. Here in this table, there are only energy and enthalpy. But for many codes, and that's what Moshe did this morning, you want to work with temperature because everyone understands temperature. So if you start from the energy equation and go to temperature, and that's done in the book, you arrive to this equation. Here you have a second heat release. And believe it or not, uh, one of my students did not see that initially. We tried to compare this one to the other one, and they didn't match because it's not the same. Everyone calls it the heat release, but there are two heat releases. There's one heat release for heat and enthalpy, and there's another one for temperature. And the difference of the two, you see here, there's one for energy, it will be the same for enthalpy. And here there is one for temperature. Are they different? Yeah, they are not the same. The first one is minus sum of the omega k delta h k f k zero. But the second one is 
the same thing plus one term due to the sensible enthalpy. And so when we tried to compare this one and this one, we didn't have that one. So it took us six months to understand that uh, the problem was that we were not looking at the same reaction rate. So there is a heat release, but there are actually two heat releases. So again, if you don't understand that, you know, and you go blindly into that, trying to compare your heat release to someone else's heat release, you might, you know, <laughs> have a long time to, to go. Uh, these two terms are equal if the CPs are equal. This is why Moshe doesn't care about them. Uh, if you say that CPK is constant and equal to CP, the difference between omega prime T and omega T goes away and you're left with equality. But if you do complex chemistry, no, it's not true. And then you have to worry about it. And you end up, when you say, when you do theory, what Moshe will do tomorrow, you end up with this famous equation for temperature with only one reaction rate, which, because it's the same for everyone which says that temperature changes because of heat release and heat diffusion. And from that, you can start doing theory because it's more reasonable in terms of complexity. Okay, I will stop here. I just want to, to say something. We, once you have a computer and you have the equations, I've shown you now that you have these five plus n equations, we could stop the course here. We could say, okay, just code them and go for it. If this would be structure equation, it would work, I mean. And the point is that if you try that, my experience is that it doesn't work because uh, knowing the equations and being able to solve them doesn't help you for combustion. If you don't understand what's going on, it would be a problem. It's like solving the equations around an aircraft without knowing that there is a boundary layer around the wings. It won't work. I mean, people will just put the same number of points everywhere. They will not understand why they don't get the right drag or the lift or anything because they don't understand the physics. So what we need to do, and Moshe is doing that all the time, is that it's not a question of solving, it's a question of understanding what's going on. So we need to see what's going on in practice when we go to complex cases. And to do that, we need to solve what we call canonical problems. Uh, what are canonical problems? Those are problems when we can go to the end and have an analytical solution so that we understand, for example, what is the thickness of a flame front when it's premixed or its speed, what is the difference with the diffusion flame, etc. This is why we need to do a little bit of theory, which is what we will do tomorrow, uh, for two cases. Those are the two basic cases, the, the premixed laminar flame and the laminar diffusion flame, because for these two things, we will uh, build completely explicit analytical solution, which is actually quite amazing that you can do it everything by hand by using a few simplifications, you go to the point where you have an analytical solution. For the laminar diffusion flame, of course, we'll talk about the mixture fraction, which is also very important to understand because the mixture fraction comes from theory and then everyone is using it in the models. You know. Most turbulent combustion models use the mixture fraction. They don't even tell you that when you can use it or not. For example, for hydrogen, mixture fraction is a, a, a very badly defined concept. So, okay, uh, that means that now we have the equations. Tomorrow, uh, we'll solve them in a few cases. And once we have done that, then we can start the turbulent flames. That will be probably Wednesday. Any additional question for today? Or comment? Yeah? If you use the correction velocities, you can solve for the n equations. What a lot of people do uh, in most flames, they use n2 as a, as a com com compensation for all the others. And then when you look at the n2 profiles, they do funny things. They go up and down. They are no monotonic. So my recommendation is to use n equations, n species, and the correction velocities. But this is, this is, a, uh, this is a tough question. Uh, not everyone does the same thing. You know? A lot of people are taking the easy way, one minus sum, but they don't use the correction velocity. And they just uh, hope that N2 will absorb all the mistakes. And I don't like that. I think it's better to use the correction velocities. Yeah, then, the, and then, then we don't actually, in our code, we don't use the, the, the mass conservation. It is just uh, implicitly obtained by summing all the others.
Yes. Yeah. We have, we have n equations, and we check that the total mass is conserved, yeah. that the sum of the yk is equal to unity. OK, I think we have enough for today. Huh? So we start again tomorrow. Thanks.